Chapter One: The Big Boy Next Door. Bets was feeling very excited. Her big brother Pip was coming home from school that day for the long summer holidays. She had been without him for three months and had felt very lonely. Now she would have him again. And Larry and Daisy will be home tomorrow," she said to her mother. "Oh, Mummy, it will be fun to have so many children to play with again." Larry and Daisy were Pip's friends. They were older than Bets, but they let her play with them. In the Easter holidays, the four of them, with another boy and his dog, had had a great adventure finding out who had burnt down a cottage. "We were the five find outers," said Bets, remembering everything. We found out the whole mystery, Mummy, didn't we? Oh, I wish we could solve another mystery these holidays. Her mother laughed. Oh, it was just a bit of luck that you solved the mystery of the burnt cottage, she said. There won't be any more mysteries, so don't expect any bets. Now hurry up and get ready. It's time to meet Pip. Pip was most excited to be home again. When he got back with Bets, he tore round the garden looking at everything. It seemed to him as if he had been away for years. His little sister tore round with him, chattering at the top of her voice all the time. She adored Pip, but he didn't take very much notice of her. Larry and Daisy are coming back tomorrow," she panted as she rushed round after Pip. "Oh, Pip, do you think we can be the find outers again?" "Only if there's something to find out," said Pip. "Oh, I forgot to tell you, Fatty is coming for the holidays too." His parents liked Peterswood so much when they stayed here at Easter that they have bought a little house, and Fatty will be here for the holes. Oh, good," said Bets happily. "I like Fatty. He's kind to me. We shall really be the five find outers again then. And oh, Pip, I suppose Buster is coming, isn't he? Of course," said Pip. Buster was Fatty's little black Scotty dog, loved by all the children. It will be nice to see old Buster again. How do you know about Fatty coming? Asked Bets, still trotting round after Pip. He wrote to me," said Pip. "Wait a minute, I've got the letter here. He sent a message to you in it." The boy felt in his pockets and took out a crumpled letter. Bets took it from him eagerly. It was very short, written in extremely neat handwriting. "Dear Pip." Just to say, my parents have bought White House not far from you, so I'll be seeing you in the summer holes. Hope we have another mystery to solve. It would be fun to be the five find outers and dog again. Give my love to little Bets. I'll pop down and see you as soon as I get back. Yours, Frederick Algernon Trotville. Why doesn't he sign himself Fatty? Asked Bets. I think Frederick Algernon Trotville sounds so silly. Well, Fatty is silly sometimes," said Pip. "I hope he won't come back full of himself." Larry and Daisy came back the next day about three o'clock. After tea, they raced off to see Pip and Bets. It was lovely to be all together again. Bets felt a little left out after a bit because she was the only one who did not go to boarding school and did not understand some of the things the others said. I wish I wasn't only eight years old. She thought for about the thousandth time. Larry's thirteen, and the others are twelve, ages older than me. I shall never catch them up. Just as they were all exchanging their news and laughing and chattering, there came the scampering of feet up the drive, and a small black Scotty dog hurled himself into the middle of them, yapping excitedly. "It's Buster! Oh, Buster, you're back again!" cried Daisy in delight. "Good old Buster." Dear old Buster, you're fatter. Hello, Buster dog. Glad to see you, old fellow. Darling Buster, I've missed you so. They were all so engaged in making a fuss of the excited little dog that they didn't see Fatty, Buster's master, walking up to them. Bets saw him first. She jumped to her feet with a squeal and rushed to Fatty. She flung her arms round him and hugged him. Fatty was pleased. He liked little Bets. He gave her a hug back. The others grinned at him. "Hello, Fatty," said Larry. "Had a good term." "I was top of my form," said Fatty, not looking very modest about it. "He's the same old Fatty," 
said Pip with a grin. Top of this, that and the other, full of brains as usual, best boy in the school. Shut up, said Fatty, giving Pip a friendly punch. I suppose you were bottom of your form. It was lovely to lie on the grass, play with Buster, and think of the eight or nine long sunny weeks ahead. No lessons, no rules, no being kept in or writing out lines. The summer holidays were really the nicest of all. Any news, Bets? asked Fatty. Any mysteries turned up? Any problems to solve? We're still the five find outers and dog, don't forget. I know, said Bets happily. But there isn't any mystery at present, Fatty. I haven't even seen old Clearorf for weeks. Clearorf was the burly village policeman, Mr. Goon. The children always called him Clearorf because that was what he said whenever he saw them. He didn't like children, and they didn't like him. Bets just hasn't any news at all, said Pip. Nothing at all seems to have happened in Peterswood since we left to go to school. Bets suddenly remembered something. Oh, I've just remembered," she said. "Somebody has come to live next door." The house next door had been empty for a year or two. The other children looked at Bets. "Any children there?" asked Pip. "No," said Bets. "At least I don't think so. I've seen a big boy there, but I think he works in the garden. I hear him whistling sometimes. He whistles awfully nicely. Oh." And there are lots of cats there. Very funny cats. Cats? What sort of cats? Said Pip in surprise, and Buster pricked up his ears and growled at the mention of cats. They've got dark brown faces and tails and legs, said Bets, and cream-coloured fur. I saw the girl who looks after them carrying one once. It looked very peculiar. She means Siamese cats, said Larry. Have they got bright blue eyes, Bets? I don't know," said Bets. "I wasn't near enough to see. Anyway, cats have green eyes, not blue, Larry. Siamese cats have bright blue ones," said Fatty. "I know because my aunt once had one, a beauty called Patterbang. They are valuable cats." "I'd like to go in next door and see them some day," said Daisy, thinking that a cat with bright blue eyes, dark brown face, legs and tail, and cream-coloured fur sounded very lovely. Who's the owner, Bets? Somebody called Lady Candling," said Bets. "I've never seen her. She is away a lot, I think." The children lay on their backs talking. Buster went from one to another, licking their faces and making them squeal and push him away. Then there came the sound of a cheerful whistling just over the wall. It was a fine whistle, clear and melodious. "That's the big boy next door I told you about." Said Bets, "Doesn't he whistle nicely?" Larry got up and went to the wall. He hopped up on a big flower pot and looked over the wall. He saw a boy there, about fifteen, a big lad with a round red face, startlingly blue eyes that looked rather surprised, and a big mouth full of very white teeth. The lad was hoeing the bed below the wall. He looked up when he saw someone peeping over. He grinned, showing all his white teeth. "Hello." Said Larry, "Are you the gardener next door?" "Lorks, no," said the boy, grinning even more widely. "I'm the gardener's help. Mister Tapping is the gardener. Him with the hooky nose and bad temper." Larry didn't think that Mister Tapping sounded very nice. He glanced up the garden, but Mister Tapping and his hooky nose were not in sight. "Could we come over and see the cats one day?" asked Larry. It's Siamese cats, isn't it? That Lady Candling has. Yes, lovely creatures they are," said the boy. "Well, you better come when Mister Tupping is out. He reckons that the whole place is his, cats and all, the way he behaves. Come in tomorrow afternoon. He'll be out then. You can get over this wall. The girl who helps with the cats will be here. Miss Harmer, her name is. She won't mind you seeing them. Right o," said Larry, pleased. We'll be over here tomorrow afternoon. I say, what's your name? But before the boy could answer him, an angry voice sounded from not far off. Luke, Luke, where have you got to? Didn't I tell you to clear away that rubbish? Luke raised startled blue eyes to Larry and put his hoe over his shoulder.
He looked scared. That's him, he said in a whisper. That's Mr. Tuppin. I'll be going now. You come on over tomorrow. He went up the path. Larry slipped back to the others. He's the gardener's help, he said. His name's Luke. He looks nice. Are we to see the cats tomorrow? Bats asked. I heard you saying something about them. Yes, tomorrow afternoon, when Mr. Tupping, the gardener, is out, said Larry. We'll hop over the wall. Better not take old Buster, though. You know what he is with cats. Buster growled when he heard the word. Cats? What did the children want to go and see cats for? Silly, useless animals with paws full of nasty pins and needles. Cats were only good for one thing, and that was to chase. Chapter 2 Horrid Mr. Tupping The next afternoon, the children remembered that they were to go and see the Siamese cats. Larry went to the wall and whistled for Luke. The boy came along after a while, smiling and showing his white teeth. It's safe to come, he said. Mr. Tuppin is out. Soon all the children were over the wall. Fatty helped Bets. Buster was left behind and was most annoyed about it. He barked angrily and stood up on his hind legs, pawing the wall desperately. Poor Buster, said Bets, sorry for him. Never mind, Buster. We'll soon be back. No dogs allowed in here, said Luke. Because of the cats, you know. They're prize cats. One no end of money, so Miss Harmer says. Do you live here? asked Larry as they walked up the path towards some big greenhouses. No, I live with my stepfather, said Luke. My mother's dead. I've got no brothers or sisters. This is my first job. My name's Luke Brown and I'm fifteen. Oh, said Larry. I'm Lawrence Dakin, and I'm thirteen. This is Margaret, my sister. She's twelve. We call her Daisy. This is Frederick Algernon Trotville. He's twelve, too, and he's called Fatty. I'd rather be called Frederick, thanks, said Fatty in a cross voice. There's no reason for me to be called Fatty by every Tom, Dick and Harry. You aren't Tom, Dick or Harry. You're called Luke, aren't you? said Betts to Luke. He grinned. I'll call you Frederick if you like. He said to Fatty. I'm Elizabeth Hilton, and I'm eight, and I'm called Betts, said Betts, afraid that Larry was going to leave her out. And this is Philip, my brother. He's twelve, and he's called Pip. They told Luke where they lived, and he told them where he lived, in a tumble-down cottage by the river. By this time they had left the greenhouses behind, and were going through a beautiful rose garden. Beyond it rose a green-painted building. That's the cat house, said Luke. And there's Miss Harmer. A young woman of about twenty, dressed in trousers and a tweed jacket, was near the cat house. She looked surprised to see the five children. Hello, she said. Where have you come from? We came over the wall, said Larry. We wanted to see the cats. They're not ordinary ones, are they? Oh, no, said Miss Harmer. There they are. Do you like them? The children gazed into the big cage-like building. There were quite a number of cats there, all with the same striking colouring, dark brown and cream with brilliant blue eyes. They stared at the children and meowed in most peculiar voices. They're lovely, said Daisy at once. I think they look funny, said Pip. Are they really cats? They look a bit like monkeys, said Bets. The others laughed. You wouldn't think they were monkeys once you felt their sharp claws, said Miss Harmer with a laugh. All these cats are prize ones. They have been to shows and won a lot of money. Which one has won the most money, said Bets. This one over here, said Miss Harmer, and she led the way to a smaller cage, like a very large kennel on legs. Well, dark queen, aren't you a beauty? Here are some visitors to tell you how lovely you are. The big Siamese cat in the large airy cage rubbed her head against the wire netting, mewing loudly. Miss Harmer scratched her gently on the head. Dark Queen is our very, very special cat, she said. She has just won a big prize, and she's worth a fortune. 
dark queen stood up, and her dark brown tail rose in the air, swaying gently to and fro. Bets noticed something. She's got a few creamy hairs in the middle of her dark tail, she said. Yes, said Miss Harmer. She was bitten by one of the others there, and the hairs grew cream instead of brown. But they will turn brown later. What do you think of her? Well, she seems just exactly like all the others, said Daisy. I mean, they are exactly alike, aren't they? Yes, they are, said Miss Harmer. They have exactly the same colouring, you see. But I can always tell the difference, even when they are all mixed up together. Fancy a cat being worth a fortune," said Fatty, staring at Dark Queen, who stared back with unwinking blue eyes. "Look, you've got eyes as blue as Dark Queen's. You've got Siamese cat's eyes." Everyone laughed, and Luke looked rather embarrassed. "Could you get Dark Queen out?" asked Daisy, who was longing to hold the beautiful cat. Is she tame? Oh yes," said Miss Harmer. "They are all tame. We only keep them in cages because they are so valuable. We couldn't let them roam free in case someone stole them." She took a key from a nail and unlocked the cage door. She lifted Dark Queen out and held her. The beautiful cat rubbed against her, purring in a deep voice. Daisy stroked her, and to her delight, the cat jumped into her arms. Oh. Isn't she friendly? Said Daisy joyfully. Then there came a great disturbance. Buster suddenly rushed along the path and flung himself on Fatty, barking joyfully. Dark Queen leapt straight out of Daisy's arms and disappeared into the bushes. Buster, surprised, stared for a moment, and then, with a loud and joyful yelp, plunged after her. There was a terrific scrimmage. Miss Harmer squealed. Luke's mouth fell open, and he looked frightened. All the cats set up a meowing. Fatty called fiercely, "Buster, come here! Buster, do you hear me? Come here!" But no amount of calling could get Buster away if there was a cat to chase. Miss Harmer ran in despair to the bushes. Only Buster was there, his nose bleeding from a scratch, his tongue hanging out, his eyes very bright and excited. "Where's Dark Queen?" Wailed Miss Harmer, "Oh, this is awful! Puss, puss, puss!" Bets began to cry. She couldn't bear to think that Dark Queen had gone. She thought she heard a noise in some bushes right at the end of the path, and she ran off to see, tears running down her cheeks. Then there came another commotion. Someone walked up to the cages, came round them, and it was Mister Tupping, the gardener. Luke stared at him in fright. "What's all this?" Shouted Mister Tapping, "Who are you? What are you doing in my garden?" "It isn't your garden," said Fatty boldly. "It's Lady Candling's, and she's a friend of my mother's." It wasn't a bit of good telling Mister Tapping that it wasn't his garden. He felt that it belonged to him. He felt that every flower was his, every pea and every smallest currant. And here were children and a dog in his garden. He detested children, dogs, cats, and birds. You get out of here! He shouted in an angry voice. Go on, get out at once. Do you hear me? And if I catch you here again, I'll send you packing and tell your fathers. Miss Harmer, what's the matter with you? Dark Queen is gone! Wailed Miss Harmer, who seemed just as much afraid of Mister Tapping as Luke. Serves you right if you lose your job, said Mister Tapping. What use are them cats? I'd like to know. Just rubbish. That's all they are. Good riddance if one is gone. Shall we stay and help you to look for Dark Queen? Said Daisy to Miss Harmer. You get out," said Mister Tapping, and his big hooky nose got very red. His stone-coloured eyes glared at Daisy. He was an ugly, bad-tempered-looking fellow with straw-coloured hair streaked with grey. The children didn't like the look of him at all. They decided to go. Mister Tupping looked as if he might chase them at any moment. They made their way to the wall. They saw that Bets was not with them, but they thought she must have run back and climbed over the wall in her fear of the surly gardener. Fatty called Buster. "No, you leave that dog with me," said Mister Tupping. "A good hiding will do him good. I'll give him one, and he won't come interfering in my garden again."
Don't you dare to touch my dog! cried Fatty at once. He'll bite you! Mr. Tupping made a grab for Buster and got him by the collar. Fatty was almost beside himself with anger, but Mr. Tupping put the dog into a shed, shut the door, turned the key, and put it into his pocket. Then he turned to Fatty with such a mean look that the boy turned and ran. Soon, all four were over the wall, lying on the grass, panting and angry. They had left Luke behind and Miss Harmer. They had left Bets behind, too, though they didn't know it. And Buster was locked in the shed. Hateful man! said Daisy, almost in tears. The beast! said Fatty between his teeth. Poor old Buster! said Pip, hearing an anguished whine in the distance. Where's Bets? said Larry, looking all round. Bets! Bets! Where are you? There was no answer. Bets was still over the wall. She must have gone indoors, said Pip. I say, what are we going to do about Buster? Fatty, we've got to rescue him, you know. We can't leave him there. Poor Buster, said Daisy. And poor Dark Queen. Oh, I do hope she is found. I wonder how Buster got over the wall. He didn't, said Fatty. He couldn't. He must have thought hard, run down the drive and up the drive next door and into the garden to find us. You know what brains Buster has got. Oh, golly, how are we going to rescue him? How I hate that man, Mr. Tupping. How awful for Luke to have to work for him. I'll go and find Bets, said Pip. She must have gone to hide or something. Maybe she's scared. He went into the house to find her and soon came out looking puzzled. She's not anywhere about, he said. I've called and called. Wherever can she be? I suppose she did come back over the wall. She can't be in next door's garden still, can she? But she was. Bets was hiding there, and what was she to do? She couldn't get over the wall by herself, and she didn't dare to run down the drive in case Mr. Tupping saw her. Chapter 3 Luke is a good friend. When Bets had run to the bushes to see if Dark Queen was there, she had found that it was only a big blackbird that had flown out as soon as she had got there. All the same, she went into the bushes and had a look around, calling, Puss, Puss, Puss! Suddenly, she saw two bright blue eyes looking down at her from the tree above. She jumped. Then she gave a cry of delight. Oh, it's you, Dark Queen. Oh, I'm so glad I found you. She stood and thought. It was no good getting Dark Queen down until Buster was safely out of the garden. The lovely cat was much safer where she was. Bets looked up at Dark Queen and the cat began to purr. She liked the little girl. Bets saw that the tree would be easy to climb. It wasn't long before she was up on the branch beside the cat, stroking her and talking to her. Dark Queen simply loved it. She rubbed her dark brown head against the little girl and purred very loudly. And then Bets heard Mr. Tupping. Oh dear, the gardener must have come back. He wasn't out after all. She listened to the angry yelling. She did not dare to join the others. She sat quietly by the cat and waited. She could not hear exactly what happened, but after a while she realised that the others must have gone back over the wall and left her. She was just about to slip down the tree to try and find Miss Harmer and tell her where Dark Queen was, when footsteps came along the path. The little girl peeped between the leaves of the tree and saw Mr. Tupping and Luke. "'I'll teach you to let children into my garden,' said Mr. Tupping. "'You're paid to do work, you are.' You'll stay here and work two hours overtime for letting them children in. Mr. Tupping went off down another path. Luke picked up a hoe and was just setting off in the opposite direction when Bats called softly to him. Luke! Luke dropped his hoe with a clatter and looked all round, startled. He could see no one. Luke! called Bats again. I'm here, up the tree, and Dark Queen is with me. Then Luke saw the little girl up the tree and the Siamese cat beside her. Bet slipped down and stood beside him. Help me over the wall, Luke, she said. Well, if Mr. Tuppy sees me, I'll lose my job, said Luke. 
his big red face as worried as Betts's little one. Well, I don't want you to lose your job, said Betts. I'll try and get over by myself. But Luke would not let her do that. Worried as he was, he felt that he must help the little girl. He lifted Dark Queen down from the tree, and together the two of them walked softly up the path, keeping a sharp lookout for Mr. Tupping. Luke slipped Dark Queen into her cage and shut the door. Miss Harmer will be glad she's found, he whispered to Betts. I'll tell her in a minute. Now come on, sprint for the wall and I'll get you over. They ran for the wall. Luke gave Betts a leg up, and soon she was sitting on the top. Buck up, called Luke in a low voice. Mr. Tuppen is coming. Betts jumped down at once, falling on hands and knees and grazing them. She rushed to the lawn, seeing the others there, and flung herself down beside them. Betts, wherever have you been? cried Pip. Were you left behind? said Fatty. Oh, look at your poor knees! And my hands, too! said Betts in a trembling voice, holding out bleeding hands. Fatty got out his hanky and wiped them. How ever did you get over the wall by yourself? he asked. I didn't. Luke helped me, though he was afraid that Mr. Tubbing would come along and catch him. Then he would lose his job, said Betts. Jolly decent of him to help you then. Said Larry, and the others agreed. I like Luke, said Betts. I think he's very, very nice. I do wish he hadn't got into trouble through letting us come over the wall and see the cats. A distant whining came on the air again. Betts looked puzzled. She looked all round. Where's Buster? she asked. She had not heard him being dragged away and locked up, though she had heard the noise of the commotion. The others told her. The little girl was indignant and upset. Oh, we must rescue him! We must! We must! She cried. Fatty, do, do go over the wall and get Buster. But Fatty didn't feel at all inclined to run the risk of meeting the surly Mister Tupping again. Also, he knew that the gardener had the key of Buster's shed in his pocket. Oh dear, there's poor darling Buster howling again. Let's go to the wall and peep over. We might see Luke and get him to peep in at the shed window and say a kind word to Buster," said Betts. So they tiptoed cautiously to the wall, and Larry carefully looked over. No one was about. Then there came the sound of someone whistling. It was Luke. Larry whistled too. The distant whistling stopped, then began again. It stopped, and Larry whistled the same tune. Presently there came the sound of someone coming through the bushes. And Luke's face appeared, full and red like a round moon. "What's up?" he whispered. "I don't stop. Mister Tupping's still about." "It's Buster," whispered Larry. "Can you peep in at the shed window and just say, 'Poor fellow,' or something like that to him?" Luke nodded and disappeared. He went towards the shed, keeping a sharp lookout for the gardener. He saw him in the distance, taking off his coat to do a bit of work. He hung it on a nail outside one of the greenhouses. He caught sight of Luke and yelled at him. Now then, have you finished that bed yet? I want you to come and tie up some tomatoes. Luke shouted something back and went into the bushes nearby. He watched Mister Tapping walk off to the kitchen garden, unraveling some raffia as he went. The gardener disappeared through a green door let into the wall that ran round the kitchen garden. Then Luke did a very brave thing. He ran swiftly and quietly to Mister Tupping's coat. He slipped his hand into the outer pocket, took the key of the little shed, and raced off with it. He unlocked the shed, and Buster rushed out. Luke tried to catch him in order to bundle him over the wall, but Buster escaped him and tore off down a path. Luke locked the door quickly, ran back to the gardener's coat, and slipped the key back into the pocket. Then he went to join Mister Tupping in the kitchen garden, hoping to goodness that Buster had had the sense to shoot off down the drive. But Buster had lost his way. He suddenly appeared in the kitchen garden and gave a yap of joy when he saw Luke. Mister Tupping looked up at once. "That dog," he said in astonishment and anger. "Blessed if it isn't that dog again! How did he get out of the shed? Didn't I lock that door? And isn't the key in my pocket?" I saw you lock the door, sir," said Luke. "Perhaps it's a different dog." 
Mr. Tupping waved his arms wildly and yelled at Buster. Buster gambled into the kitchen garden and ran right across a bed of carrots. Luke felt certain the little dog did it on purpose. Mr. Tupping went purple in the face. You get out! he yelled. Buster began to dig hard in the middle of the carrots, sending roots flying into the air. Mr. Tupping went quite mad. He rushed over to the carrot bed, shouting, and Buster retired a good way off and began to dig up some onions. Buster ran out of the green door in the kitchen garden wall and tore off down the nearest path. He soon found his way out of the garden and went racing up the drive of Pip's house next door. He flung himself joyfully on the surprised children. Buster! Darling Buster! How did you get free? Everyone spoke to Buster at once. He rolled over on his back and lay there, all his feet in the air, his tail thumping the ground and his pink tongue out. Good dog, said Fatty, patting his tummy. I wish you could tell us how you got free. The children lay in wait for Luke that night as he went home. His time for knocking off was usually five, but that day Mr. Tapping kept him at work till seven, and the boy, big and strong as he was, was tired out. Luke! How did Buster get free? Did you know he was free? cried Pip. Luke nodded. Got the key out of old Mr. Tuppin's coat myself and let the little dog out, he said. Cool! You should have seen Mr. Tuppin's face when Buster came into the kitchen garden. He nearly had a fit. Luke, did you really let Buster out? cried Fatty. He gave the big boy a thump on the back. I say, thanks an awful lot. We were terribly upset about him. I guess you were scared to do it. Reckon I was, said Luke, scratching his head and remembering how scared he had felt. But the little dog meant no harm. Nice little dog he is. I like dogs. I guess you'd all be worried about him. Oh, I do think you're nice, Luke, said little Betts, hanging on to his arm. You got me safely over the wall and you set Buster free. We'll all be your friends. Larry said, and what's more, in return for what you've done for us today, we promise to help you if you ever want help. See? Don't reckon I'll want no help from kids like you, said Big Luke in a friendly voice. But thanks all the same. Don't you come over the wall any more now. I might lose my job if you do. We won't, said Fatty. And don't forget, if you're ever in real trouble, we'll help you, Luke. Chapter 4 Miss Trimble Makes Trouble Luke proved to be a most amusing friend to have. He couldn't read or write well, but he knew all kinds of things that the children didn't know. He could make whistles out of hollow twigs, and he presented Bets with a wonderful collection. He showed her how to whistle little tunes on them, and she was thrilled. Then he knew every bird in the countryside, where they nested, what their eggs were like, and the songs they sang. Soon the five children and Buster were going for walks with Luke, hanging on to his words, thinking that he was really marvellous. Funny he knows all that, and yet can't read or write properly, said Pip. He's terribly clever with his hands, too. He can carve animals and birds out of bits of wood in no time. Look at this squirrel he did for me. He's doing a model of Dark Queen for me, said Bats proudly. It's going to be exactly like her, even to the little ring of pale cream hairs in her dark brown tail. Luke is going to paint the model for me, blue eyes and all. Luke finished the wooden carving of Dark Queen, the Siamese cat, two days later. The children heard his now familiar whistle over the wall and crowded there to see what he wanted. Luke handed over the cat model. It was really excellent. Even Fatty, who fancied himself very much at all kinds of artwork, was very much impressed. He handled the little model admiringly. Fine, Luke, he said. You've got the colouring marvellously, too. Dark brown ears, face, legs, tail, and creamy fur, and brilliant blue eyes, and even the tiny ring of creamy hairs round the middle of Dark Queen's tail. That's where she got bitten by another cat, isn't it? Yes, said Luke. But they'll grow dark again, all right. Miss Harmer says it won't spoil her for shows. How's old Mr. Tupping these days? asked Pip. Awful, said Luke. I wish I hadn't got to work for him. He's that bad-tempered. 
I'm always afraid of him complaining about me to my stepfather too. My stepfather doesn't like me. The five children were very sorry for Luke. He didn't seem to have much of a life. He was a kindly, generous fellow, always ready to do anything he could for them. He loved little Bets and stuck up for her when Pip teased her, as he often did. Buster adored Luke. He's grateful to you for saving him from Mister Tapping," said Fatty, watching Buster trying to climb up Luke's legs, panting with delight. He's a nice little dog," said Luke. "I like dogs, always did. I like them cats too. Beautiful things, aren't they?" We saw someone else in your garden today," said Larry, a middle-aged lady, very thin, with a rather red nose, glasses that kept falling off, and a funny little bun of hair at the back of her neck. Who is she? That's not Lady Candling, is it? Oh no," said Luke. "That's her companion, Miss Tremble. Miss Tremble, I call her to myself. She's that scared of old Mister Tupping. She has to do the flowers for the house, you see. And if she goes out and picks them when Mister Tupping is there, he follows her around like a dog, ready to bite her, and says, 'If you pick any more of them roses, that'll spoil the tree. If you take them poppies of mine, they'll fall to bits. You shouldn't pick 'em in the sun. Things like that." The poor old thing trembles and shakes, and I feel downright sorry for her. Everyone seems afraid of Mister Tupping," said Daisy. "Horrid fellow! I hope he gets a punishment one day for being so hateful, but I bet he won't." "Come and see my little garden, Luke," said Bets, pulling the big boy up the path. "It's got some lovely snapdragons out." Luke went with her. It was a funny little garden done by Bets herself. It had one old rose tree in it, a tiny gooseberry bush, some Virginia stock, a few red snapdragons, and some Shirley poppies. Fine," said Luke. "Did you have any gooseberries off that little bush?" "Not one," said Bet sadly. "And Luke, I planted two strawberries last year, nice red ripe ones, and they didn't even grow up into strawberry plants. I was dreadfully disappointed. I did so want to pick strawberries of my own this year." Luke laughed his loud, clear laugh. <laughs> strawberries don't grow from strawberries, Bets. They grow from runners. You know, long stems sent out from the plants. The runners send up little new plants here and there. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a few of our runners from next door. I'm cleaning up the beds now, and there'll be a lot of runners thrown away on the rubbish heap. You can have some of those. Will it matter? Asked Bets doubtfully. Would they really be rubbish? Yes, all burnt up on the rubbish heap," said Luke. "It's Mister Tapping's day off tomorrow. You come on over the wall, and I'll show you how the runners grow and give you some." So the next day, Pip helped Bets over the wall, and Luke helped her down the other side. He took her to the strawberry bed and showed her the new plants growing from the runners sent out from the old plants. It's very clever of the strawberries to grow new plants like that, isn't it? Said Bets. She saw a pile of pulled-up runners in Luke's barrow nearby. Oh, she said, "Are these the ones you're going to throw away? How many can I have?" "You take six," said Luke, and he picked out six good runners, each with little healthy strawberry plants on them. He gave them to Bets. "Who's that?" said Bets suddenly, as she saw someone coming towards them. "It's Miss Tremble," said Luke. "You needn't be afraid of her." She won't hurt you. Miss Trimble came up, smiled at Bets. Bets didn't like her very much. She was so thin and bony. She wore glasses without any rims, pinched onto the sides of her nose. They kept falling off and dangled on a little chain. Bets watched to see how many times they would fall off. Well, uh, and uh, who is this little girl? Said Miss Trimble in a bird-like voice, nodding at Bets. Her glasses at once fell off, and she put them on again. "I'm Bets from next door," said Bets. "And uh, what have you got there?" said Miss Trimble, looking at the strawberry plants in Bets's hand. "Some uh, lovely treasure." "No," said Bets. "Just some strawberry runners." Miss Trimble's glasses fell off again, and she put them back. <laughs> "Be careful; they don't run away from you," <laughs> she said. And laughed loudly at her own joke. Bets didn't think it was very funny, but she laughed too out of politeness. Miss Trimble's glasses fell off again. 
Why don't they keep on? Asked Bets with interest. Is your nose too thin to hold them on? <laughs> What a funny little girl! Said Miss Trimble, laughing again. Well,、uh, goodbye, my dear. I must away to my little jobs. She went off, and Bets was glad. Her glasses fell off six times, Luke. She said. You're a caution, you are," said Luke. "I only hope she doesn't go and tell Mister Tuppin she saw you here." But that is just what Miss Trimble did do. She did not mean any harm. She did not even know that Mister Tuppin had ordered the children out of the garden some days before. She was picking roses the very next day when Mister Tuppin came along behind her and stood watching her. Miss Trimble began to feel scared. As she always did when the surly gardener came along, he was so rude. She turned and gave him a frightened smile. "Lovely morning, Mister Tapping, isn't it?" she said. "Beautiful roses, these." "Won't be beautiful long when you finish messing about with them," said Mister Tapping. "Oh, I, I'm not spoiling them," said Miss Trimble. I, "I know how to pick roses." "You don't know any more than a child." Said surly Mister Tapping, enjoying seeing how scared poor Miss Trimble was of him. The mention of a child made Miss Trimble remember Bets. Oh, she said, trying to turn the conversation away from roses. Oh,、uh, there was such a, a dear little girl with Luke in the garden yesterday. Mister Tapping's face grew as black as thunder. A girl here! He shouted. Where's that Luke? I'll skin him if he lets those kids in here whilst my back is turned. He went off to find Luke. Miss Trimble shook with fright, and her glasses fell off and got so entangled in her lace collar that it took quite twenty minutes for her trembling hands to disentangle them.、Uh, most unpleasant fellow, she kept murmuring to herself. Dear, dear, I hope I haven't got poor Luke into trouble. He's such a pleasant fellow, and only a boy too. I do hope he won't get into trouble. Luke was in trouble. Mister Tupping strode up to him and glowered, his stone-coloured eyes almost hidden under his shaggy brows. "Who was that girl in here yesterday?" he demanded. "One of them kids next door, was it? What was she doing here?" "Nothing. She shouldn't, though, Mister Tupping," said Luke. "She's a good little thing." "I said, what was she doing here?" shouted Mister Tupping. Taking the peaches, I suppose, or picking the plums. She's the little girl from next door," said Luke hotly. "She wouldn't take nothing like that. I just gave her some strawberry runners for her garden. That's all. They'd have been burnt on the rubbish heap anyway." Mister Tupping looked as if he was going to have a fit. To think that Luke should give anyone anything out of his garden! He really thought it was his garden and not Lady Candling's. He didn't stop to think that Lady Candling would willingly give a little girl a few strawberry runners, for she was fond of children. Mister Tupping marched straight to the wall. Luke felt certain that all the children were out because he had heard their voices and their bicycle bells some time back on the road. He stooped over his work. He felt angry with Miss Trimble. Why had she given Bets away? The children had gone out on their bicycles, all but Bets. The ride they were going on was too far for her, so the little girl had been left behind with Buster, much to her annoyance. It was such a nuisance being four or five years younger than the others. They kept on leaving her out. Buster, come and sit by me, and I'll read you a story about rabbits," said Bets. At the word rabbits. Buster ran to Bets. He thought she was going to take him for a walk, but instead she sat down under a tree and took a book from under her arm. She opened it and began to read. Once there was a big fat rabbit called Waffly. He, but Buster was bored. He got up and ran to the bottom of the drive, waiting for the others to come back. Bets sat there alone. She suddenly heard a noise and looked up. And oh dear me! There, climbing over the wall, looking as fierce as could be, was that horrid Mister Tupping. Chapter Five.
Tupping, Buster, and Mr. Goon. Bets was horrified. She couldn't even get up and run away. She looked round for Buster, but he wasn't there. Did you take my strawberry runners? Asked Mr. Tupping. Show me where you put them, he said. Bets led him up to her garden. As soon as Mr. Tupping saw the neatly planted, well-watered little strawberry plants, he bent down and wrenched every one of them up. He tore them up into tiny pieces and threw them onto the bonfire that was smouldering nearby. Bets sobbed bitterly. "You're a bad girl," said Mr. Tupping. "And I tell you this: if you come into my garden again, I'll go straight to Mr. Goon, the policeman. Great friend of mine he is, and he'll be along to see your father before you can say Jack Robinson." With that, Mr. Tupping began to walk back to the wall. But before he could get there, Buster came running up. He heard Bets crying. He smelt Mr. Tupping, and he put two and two together at once. Buster certainly had brains. He flew straight at Mr. Tupping and caught him by the trouser leg, growling in a most fearsome way. Mr. Tupping gave a howl. "Call your dog off!" he yelled. Bets called Buster. "Oh, Buster, don't come here, Buster!" But Buster was having a lovely time. <laughs> Mr. Tupping was frightened. Buster tore a large piece out of Mr. Tupping's trouser leg and retired under a bush to chew it. Mr. Tupping took his chance and shinned up the wall. Buster immediately came out from the bush, snapping at Mr. Tupping's ankles, getting another bit of trouser. Mr. Tupping gave a yell and fell off on the other side of the wall. Bets was half laughing and half crying by now. Oh, Buster, darling Buster, I think you're marvelous," she said. <laughs> Said Buster happily, still chewing a bit of trouser. Bets sat down and thought. She longed to run in and tell her mother all about everything and feel her mother's arms round her. The little girl had had a shock, but she was afraid that if she told her mother, Mummy would go and tell Lady Candling, and it might all lead to getting Luke into trouble. And Mister Goon doesn't like us ever since we solved the mystery of the burnt cottage before he did," said Bets to herself. So he would love to listen to everything that Mister Tupping said and make a fuss about it. Oh, I do wish the others were here. They came back at last. Fatty noticed Betsy's worried face at once. "What's up?" he said. "Got into a row, little Bets." "Oh, an awful thing happened this morning," said Bets, glad to pour out everything to the others. She told them the whole story. The three boys went red with rage to think that little Bets should have been treated like that. Daisy put her arms round her and gave her a hug. "Poor old Bets," she said. "Go on, what happened next?" Then Bets told about Buster and how he had torn pieces out of Mister Tupping's trouser legs. The children roared with laughter and gave Buster a great petting. "Good dog, good dog," said Pip. "That's the stuff to give to surly old Mister Tupping. Good dog." Fatty put his arm round Bets. You did quite right not to tell your mother," he said. "I mean, it will save Luke a lot of trouble if we keep this quiet." "Fancy tearing up Betsy's plants like that," said Pip. "If I was old enough, I'd go and shake Mister Tupping till his teeth fell out." The others laughed. They all felt like that when they thought of little Bets and her precious strawberry plants. Buster barked and wagged his tail. "He says he did his best to give Mister Tupping a shaking." Said Daisy. The children did their best to make up to Bets for her upset. They were very kind to her. Larry went straight home, asked his mother if he might dig up a few strawberry plants for Bets, and brought them back. He planted them himself for her, and the little girl was very pleased. Fatty brought her a book. He spent all his pocket money on it and never even said so, which was good for Fatty. Daisy gave her one of her old dolls, which pleased Bets more than anything. Even Pip, who usually hadn't much time for his baby sister, as he called her, took her for a ride all round the garden on his big bicycle. So altogether, Bets had a good time. The children wondered if Luke had got into trouble. When they heard his familiar whistle at five o'clock, they ran down to the gate to meet him as they went home. Luke. How did Mister Tupping find out about Bets and the strawberry plants? 
Did you get into trouble? Did you know he was very unkind to Betts? Poor little Betts," said Luke. "I didn't know she was in, or I'd have gone after old Mister Tuppin. I thought you were all out. I heard your bicycle bells. You see, when Mister Tuppin came back and told me he'd gone for Betts and torn up all her plants, I could have gone for him. But he would only have reported me to Mister Goon, the policeman. So what would have been the good of that? Did you get into an awful row?" asked Betts. "How did he find out about me?" Miss Tremble must have told him the silly old thing," said Luke. "Yes, I did get into a row. I wish I could leave." "I wish you could too," said Larry. "Why can't you?" "Well, it's my first job, you see, and you should stick in your first job as long as you can," said Luke. "And there's another thing. I bet Mister Tuppin would give me a bad name if I gave him notice, and I might not be able to get another job. Then I'd get into trouble with my stepfather." I'll give him half my money. You see. You have a lot of troubles, Luke," said Daisy. "I wish we could help you." "Well, you do in a way," said Luke. "I tell you things, don't I? I don't keep 'em all bottled up like I used to. It's nice to tell 'em to somebody. Look, there's Mister Goon, the village bobby. Mister Goon, burly, red-faced, with bulging frog eyes, was walking down the lane towards the children. Do you suppose he's going to see Mister Tupping? Asked Betts in alarm. Don't know," said Luke, also looking rather alarmed. He wasn't keen to come face to face with Mister Goon. I wonder if he'll tell us to clear off," whispered Daisy. "Do you remember how often he shouted 'Clear off' to us in the Easter holidays? Horrid old clear off!" Mister Goon came slowly towards them. The children watched him. Buster growled. Mr. Goon pretended not to notice any of them. He did not feel at all friendly towards the children, since they had solved a mystery he had been unable to solve himself. Buster suddenly flew round Mr. Goon and barked madly at his ankles. He did not attempt to bite him or snap at him, but he startled Mr. Goon all the same. "Clear off," said Mr. Goon to Buster in a threatening tone. "You here? Clear off!" "Buster, come here," said Fatty. But not in a very commanding voice. Buster took no notice. He was having a lovely day. First, Mister Tupping, and now Mister Goon to frighten. Oh, what a treat for a little black Scotty! Clear off," said Mister Goon. Luke gave one of his loud laughs as Buster jumped nimbly out of the way of Mister Goon's feet. The policeman looked at him. "Oh, you," he said. "You'll get into trouble, you will, if you laugh at the law." What are you doing here? You clear off. He's our friend," said Fatty. "Come here, Buster." Mister Tupping, hearing the noise of barking and shouting, appeared at the other gate of the drive. He knew Buster at once. "You'd better report that there dog," remarked Mister Tupping to the policeman. "Tore a bit out of me trousers today. Look here, vicious dog. That's what he is. Downright vicious." He caught sight of Luke. What are you doing hanging about here instead of going home? He asked. Luke disappeared at once, going off up the lane quickly. He wanted no more trouble from either Mister Tapping or Mister Goon. Buster returned to Fatty, who picked him up. Downright vicious dog," said Mister Tapping again. "If you want any details, Mister Goon, I'll give you them." Mister Goon did not want to report Buster because he knew that any report would go before Inspector Jenks, who was very friendly with the children. Still, he thought there would be no harm in pretending that he was going to report Buster for being vicious and out of control. So he pulled out his big black notebook, took his stubby pencil, and began to write solemnly and slowly. The children were rather alarmed. They all went back into Pip's garden at once. Betts gazed at Buster, her eyes wide with fright. Would they, would they put Buster in prison? She asked fearfully, and was very much relieved when all the others burst out laughing. Of course not," said Fatty. "Nobody ever heard of a dog's prison, Betts. Don't you worry about old Buster." Chapter Six. Dark Queen disappears. Things began to happen very quickly after this, and quite suddenly, 
the five find-outers found that there was a first-class mystery for them to solve. The children played in Pip's garden that morning, and there was a lot of excited shrieking and yelling as they played chase. It got too lively for Bats after a bit, and she begged to play something different. That afternoon, Pip's mother, Mrs. Hilton, went to tea with Lady Candling, who was now back again next door after a short holiday. You may all have a picnic tea in the garden, she told Pip. Daisy, see that everyone behaves, please. And if you haven't enough to eat, go and ask Cook politely, politely, remember, for some more bread and butter. Yes, Mrs. Hilton, thank you very much, said Daisy. The children watched Pip's mother going down the drive at half past three that afternoon, looking very smart. They were glad that they did not have to dress up and go out to tea. It was much more fun to have a picnic tea and wear old shorts and shirts. They had a lovely tea and went in twice to ask Cook for some more bread and butter. Daisy went and remembered to ask very politely. There were ripe plums and green gauges as well to eat, so it was a good tea. Soon after tea, Mrs. Hilton came back. She went straight to the children, looking rather worried. Children, she said. What do you think has happened? That lovely prize cat called Dark Queen has disappeared. Lady Candling is very upset because she is most valuable, and the dreadful thing is, Luke may have stolen her. Mummy," said Pip indignantly. "Luke's our friend. He would never, never do a thing like that. He wouldn't. He wouldn't!" cried Bats. "Oh, Mrs. Hilton," said Fatty earnestly. I really don't think you are right in saying that Luke did that. I didn't say he had," said Mrs. Hilton. "I said that he might have. All the evidence points to the fact that he was about the only one who could have done so. But he couldn't. He simply couldn't," said Daisy. "He's as honest as the day. It's much more likely to have been that hateful old Mister Tupping. Mister Tupping has been out all the afternoon with Mister Goon, the policeman, who appears to be his friend." Said Mrs. Hilton, "So it is quite impossible that he could have stolen her." The children stared at Mrs. Hilton, feeling upset and puzzled. Fatty took command of the whole affair and spoke politely to Mrs. Hilton. "Luke is a very good friend of ours, Mrs. Hilton, and if he is in trouble, we must help him. I am quite sure he had nothing to do with Dark Queen disappearing. Nothing at all. Could you please give us the whole story?" This looks like something the five find outers can tackle again, my dear Frederick. Don't talk so pompously," said Mrs. Hilton rather impatiently, "and don't start interfering in this matter for goodness' sake. It's nothing to do with you. Just because you solved one mystery quite well is no reason why you should think you can interfere in anything else that crops up. Fatty went red. He didn't like being ticked off in public like that. Mummy, please do tell us all that has happened. Said Pip. Well, said Mrs. Hilton, Miss Harmer went off for the day this morning after feeding all the cats and cleaning out their cages. Dark Queen was in the big cage with the other cats today. Miss Harmer went to catch the ten o'clock bus. Miss Trimble went with Lady Candling to see that the cats were all right at just before one o'clock, and Mister Tapping pointed out Dark Queen to them. You know what a beauty she is. The children nodded. Go on, Mummy," said Pip. Was that the last time that anyone saw Dark Queen? No," said his mother. Miss Trimble went with me to show me the cats at four o'clock just before tea, and Dark Queen was there then in the cage with the others. How do you know, Mummy? Asked Pip. How could you tell which was Dark Queen? They are all exactly alike. I know," said Mrs. Hilton. But apparently, Dark Queen has been bitten on the tail, and a few hairs there grew cream instead of dark brown. Miss Trimble pointed out the cat to me, and I remember noticing the ring of creamy hairs, most noticeable. So she was in the cage, quite safe at four o'clock. Go on," said Pip. Tapping came back at five o'clock, and he brought Mister Goon, the village policeman, with him," said Mrs. Hilton. He showed Mister Goon his prize tomatoes, and then he showed him the cats. Then Mister Tapping suddenly noticed that Dark Queen was missing. Gracious," said Fatty. Then the cat must have disappeared between four and five o'clock, Mrs. Hilton. Yes," said Pip's mother, 
and as Luke was the only one in the garden, I am afraid that he is suspected. He knew that the cat was worth a lot of money. Tapping says that the boy stole something the other day too, strawberry runners or something silly like that. Bets went fiery red. Tears came into her eyes. Those awful strawberry runners. She wondered if she should tell her mother about them, but Fatty frowned at her, warning her not to. Well, that's all," said Mrs. Hilton, pulling off her gloves. "But I'm afraid your friend Luke is in for trouble now. I wonder where he took the cat. No one seems to have seen Luke between four and five o'clock, so I suppose he could have put her into a basket and taken her off anywhere. Mummy, Luke wouldn't," burst out Bets. "You don't know how kind and honest he is. He gave me a lot of whistles he made, and this lovely model of Dark Queen too. Look." You are none of you old enough to know whether anyone is really honest or not. I'd rather you kept away from Luke until this matter is cleared up. Mrs. Hilton went towards the house and disappeared indoors. The children looked at one another in dismay. It's no good to say keep away from Luke," said Fatty. "We simply can't. He's our friend, and he's helped us lots of times, and Buster too. We've got to help him now." All the others agreed. They sat and thought about everything for a little, and then began to talk about it. Somebody must have stolen Dark Queen. There's no doubt about that," said Fatty. "It seems as if it could only be Old Luke, but we're all absolutely certain it isn't. So who else could it be?" "Let's look for clues," said Bets eagerly, remembering how exciting it had been to look for clues in the last mystery they had solved. "Let's draw up a list of suspects," said Daisy. We did that before. Now," said Fatty importantly, "it seems to me that the five find outers can really get to work again. I propose. Look here," said Larry, "you're forgetting something, Fatty. I'm head of the find outers, not you." "All right," said Fatty, looking sulky. "Go ahead then. Only I've got far more brains than you have. I was top of my form last term, and shut up, Fatty." Said everyone together except Bets. Fatty looked as if he was going to get up and go, but he was too excited and interested to be sulky for long. And soon the five children were eagerly discussing their plans. Now, let's think everything out clearly," said Daisy. Dark Queen was with the others until four o'clock because it was then that Miss Tremble and Pip's mother saw her. She wasn't there when Clearoff and Mister Tupping went to see them at five, so. In that hour, somebody must have gone to the cage, unlocked it, taken out the cat, locked the cage again, and gone off with Dark Queen, and either given her to someone else or hidden her away. Right," said Larry. "Very clearly put, Daisy. The next thing is, who could have stolen the cat? Who can we suspect?" said Pip. "Well, I suppose Miss Tremble might have slipped down and taken Dark Queen out," said Fatty. Not very likely, of course, because Miss Tremble, poor thing, is the kind of person who would have a fit if she even posted a letter without a stamp. She'd dream about it all night long. Still, we have to consider everyone who had a chance of stealing Dark Queen. Larry pulled out a notebook. "I'll write the names down," he said. "Miss Tremble is one. What about Lady Candling? She wouldn't steal her own cat, silly," said Daisy. "She might." Said Larry, "It might be insured against theft, you know. She would get a lot of money. You've got to think of all these things." He wrote down Lady Candling's name. "Mr. Tupping," said Bets. Larry shook his head very regretfully. "No, Bets. I'd love to put his name down, but if he was with Old Clearoff all the afternoon, it's just no good suspecting him. What about Miss Harmer?" Could she have possibly come back quietly and secretly from her day out and taken the cat? She knew how valuable Dark Queen was. This was quite a new idea. Everyone thought of smiling Miss Harmer. She didn't seem at all the sort of person who would steal a valuable cat from her employer. Still, her name went down on the list of suspects. We'll have to try and find out where Miss Harmer was between four and five o'clock today," said Pip. "Who else is there?" Said Daisy, "We've got Miss Tremble, Lady Candling, and Miss Harmer down. What about the cook and housekeeper next door? They would have had a chance of going down to the cat house and taking Dark Queen, wouldn't they?" 
I've never seen the cook or housekeeper," said Pip. "None of us have. We'll have to find out about them too. Goodness, we've got quite a lot of suspected people after all. We'll have a lot of work to do." The one person who is horrid enough to have done it is Mister Tupping, and he's just the very one we can't even suspect," said Beth sadly. "Well, there aren't any more suspects, are there?" "We'll have to put old Luke down," said Larry. "I know we don't suspect him, but Mister Tupping has accused him of the crime, so we'd better put him down. We can cross him out as soon as we like." So Luke's name went down too. Poor old Luke. He always seemed to be in trouble. Let's go and whistle to him," said Larry. "He hasn't gone home yet, or he'd have whistled to us and told us everything." So they went to the wall and whistled the special notes that they and Luke used for signalling to one another. But although they whistled and whistled, nobody came. Whatever could Luke be doing? Chapter Seven. Luke gets into trouble. The five children sat on top of the wall, with Buster scratching at the bricks below. They wondered what to do. Pip looked at his watch. "Just gone quarter to six," he said. "Can Luke have gone home? No, he surely would have spoken to us first. Perhaps old Clearoff is questioning him," said Fatty. This seemed very likely. The children wished they could find out. Fatty had a good idea. Look here, Pip," he said. "You could find out what's happening if you liked." "How?" asked Pip. "Well, your mother has just been to tea next door, hasn't she?" said Fatty. "You could hop over the wall and go and see what's happening. And if anyone sees you and wants to know what you're doing there, you could say that your mother has just been to tea and has she by any chance dropped her hanky in the garden?" "But she hasn't," said Pip. "Didn't you see her take it out of her bag when she was talking to us?" Of course I did," said Fatty impatiently. "It's only just an excuse. You don't need to say she did drop her hanky because we know she didn't. But you could easily say had she, couldn't you?" "It's a good idea, of Fatty's," said Larry. "It's about the only way any of us could get into the garden without being sent out at once by Clearor for Mister Tupping. Go on, Pip. Jump down and see whether you can find out what's happening. Hurry up." It's really a great bit of luck that your mother has just been there to tea. Pip was anxious to go, and yet very much afraid of meeting Mister Tupping or Clearoff. He jumped down, waved to the others, and set off through the bushes. There was no sign of Luke at all. Pip passed by the cat house, but there was no one there either. He peeped into the cage where Dark Queen should have been with the others. The cats looked at him and mewed. Pip went on down the path, round by the greenhouses, and then stood hidden in the bushes. He could hear voices nearby. He peeped through the bushes. There was a little group of people on the lawn. Pip knew most of them. There's Lady Candling, he thought, and that's Miss Tremble. Doesn't she look upset? And there's Mister Tupping, looking very pleased and important. And that's Old Clearoff the Bobby. And oh. There's poor old Luke. Poor Luke was there in the centre, looking quite bewildered and terribly scared. The policeman was standing opposite to him, big black notebook in hand, and Luke was stammering and stuttering out replies to questions that Mister Goon was barking out at him. At the back were two women, plainly the cook and the housekeeper, both looking excited. They were whispering together, nudging one another. Pip crept nearer. He could hear the questions now that were fired at poor frightened Luke. What were you doing all the afternoon? I was, I was digging up the old peas in the long bed, stammered Luke. Is that the bed by the cat house? Asked Mister Goon, scribbling something down in his book. Y y yes, sir, stuttered Luke. So you were by the cats the whole afternoon, said the policeman. Did anyone come near him? Miss Tremble came at four o'clock about with another lady," said Luke, pushing back his untidy hair. They stayed a few minutes and went. And what did you do between four and five o'clock?" said Mister Goon. 
nothing sir only d d dug he stammered just d d dug uh, alongside the cat house and nobody came near not a soul till you and mr tupping came along to see the cats and we found that dark queen was gone said mr tupping in a fierce voice well mr goon the evidence is as plain as plain isn't it dark queen was stolen between four and five o'clock and here's this boy stating that there was no one else near the cats except himself the whole of that time he took that cat no doubt about it and handed her to some friend of his for a bit of pocket money he's dishonest is luke i'm not dishonest mr tuppin i've never took a thing i shouldn't and i've worked hard for you i've stood things from you i shouldn't stand you know i'd never steal one of them cats that's enough now that's enough said mr goon i think tapping said lady candling in her low clear voice i think there is no need to say any more to luke until we know a little more about this curious happening tapping looked rather taken aback he had been enjoying himself so much that he had half forgotten lady candling was there luke turned to his mistress please ma'am he said in an urgent voice please ma'am i do beg of you not to believe what mr tuppin and mr goon say about me i didn't take dark queen i don't know where she is i've never taken a thing i shouldn't take from your garden that's a lie said mr tupping in a triumphant voice what about them strawberry runners let him go home said lady candling in a gentle voice you have questioned him enough he's only a fifteen-year-old boy after all mr goon i ask you to go now please and luke you may go home too mr goon didn't look at all pleased he was sorry he could not treat luke as he would have treated a grown man he knew he would have to let him go home he didn't like being sent off himself by lady candling either he cleared his throat loudly gave lady candling a scornful look and shut his notebook i must have a few words with your stepfather he said in a pompous tone to luke who turned very pale at these words i'll walk down with you said mr tapping it's possible that the boy's father may tell us something about his friends he must have given dark queen to one of them so poor luke was marched off between mr goon and mr tapping pip hated the policeman and the gardener poor luke what could he do against two men like that there just wasn't a chance for him pip didn't know that the two were taking luke down nearby where he was hiding and he didn't step back into the thick bushes in time to prevent himself from being seen mr tupping suddenly saw the boy's face peering out from a rhododendron bush what are you doing here he roared it's one of them kids next door mr goon he said to the surprised policeman always poking in here i'll march him straight off to her ladyship and she'll give him a good talking to luke stood staring open-mouthed as pip was marched up the path by the angry gardener lady candling had heard the noise and had turned back to the lawn to see whatever was happening now let me go said pip angrily soon they were in front of lady candling who looked extremely surprised found this boy hiding in the bushes said tupping always finding them children in here friends of luke they are up to no good i'll be bound what were you doing in my garden asked lady candling in rather a stern tone my mother has just been to tea with you lady candling said pip in his most polite voice i suppose you haven't by any chance found a handkerchief of hers left behind have you dear me are you mrs hilton's son philip asked lady candling smiling at him she was telling me about you and you have a little sister haven't you called bets yes lady candling said pip smiling sweetly too she's nice i'd like to bring her in to see you some day if i may yes do said lady candling tapping you have made a stupid mistake this little boy quite obviously came in to look for his mother's handkerchief mrs hilton was at tea with me today tapping scowled things were not going at all the way he had expected if we find your mother's handkerchief we will certainly send it in said lady candling to pip and do remember to bring in your little sister to see me won't you
I am very fond of little girls. Mr. Tapping will turn us out if we come," said Pip. "Indeed, he won't," said Lady Candling at once. "Tapping, the children are to come in when they wish to. Those are my orders." Tapping's face went red, and he looked as if he was going to burst. But he did not dare to say anything to his mistress. He turned rudely and went back to Mr. Goon and Luke, who were waiting some way off. Pip shook hands with Lady Candling, thanked her, said goodbye. And went after Tapping. Luke, he called. Luke, don't give up hope. All your friends will help you. We know you didn't do it. You clear off," said Mister Goon, now really angry. None of your sauce. Always poking your nose in and interfering. Clear off, I say. But Pip didn't clear off. Keeping just beyond Mister Goon's reach. He danced along behind the three, shouting encouraging messages to Luke and annoying the policeman and the gardener beyond measure. He heard Mister Goon say to Mister Tupping that he would return later in the evening to have a good look round that cat house. Oh, thought Pip, he's going to hunt for clues to help him to put the blame on Luke. We'd better go hunting for clues first. I'll go and tell the others. So, with a last hearty yell to Luke. Pip ran for the wall, climbed it, and rushed to tell the others all that he had heard. Things were getting really exciting. Chapter Eight, all about clues. What happened, Pip? You've been simply ages and ages," said Larry as Pip flung himself down beside the four children and Buster. "Oh." Clear off and Tapping have quite made up their minds that Luke did the deed," said Pip. "Poor old Luke. Why are they so certain he stole Dark Queen?" said Daisy. "Well, it's most unfortunate, but you see, the cat was stolen between four and five o'clock this afternoon, and Luke was working beside the cat house the whole of that time," said Pip. "He says he was, and he says too that no one else came near all that time. It's funny, isn't it?" Said Betts, puzzled. We know quite well that Luke didn't do it, and yet it seems as if he simply must have. It's a real proper mystery. It certainly is," said Fatty thoughtfully. It doesn't really seem much good questioning any of our suspects because the chief one, Luke himself, says that only he was by the cat house that afternoon, and yet I simply can't believe he stole the cat. He'd never dare to, even if he wanted to, which I'm sure he didn't. I wonder where Dark Queen is," said Betts. "Yes, if we could find her, we should have a better idea of who stole her," said Larry. "I mean, whoever has her now must be a friend of the thief. Golly, this is a puzzle, isn't it? Can't we look for clues?" asked Betts, thinking that perhaps this might help to clear Luke. "Oh, that reminds me," said Pip at once. "Old Clearoff said he was coming back tonight to have a look round the cat house." I expect he wants to find some clues himself. Clues that will point to poor old Luke, I suppose. Well, I vote we go and have a look first," said Fatty at once, getting up. "What? Go over the wall now?" said Larry in surprise. "We'll get into trouble." "We shan't," said Fatty. "We'll be gone long before Mister Tapping and Clearoff get back. They'll be having a fine time telling poor old Luke's stepfather all about him." "All right, let's go now then." Said Larry, "We might be able to find some sort of clue, though goodness knows what. Come on." Bet said, "Better not come," said Pip. "She is a bit small to go into possible trouble." "Of course I'm coming," said Bet indignantly. "Don't be mean, Pip. I only want a bit of help going over the wall. I might quite well find a clue you didn't see. I might be very useful." "You might, Bet," said Fatty, taking her part as usual. "Let her come, Pip." It's horrid to be left out of anything exciting. So Betts came. Buster was left behind, and this time he was put into the shed and locked up there, so that he wouldn't go rushing down Pip's drive and up Lady Candling's to find them. They all climbed over the wall, Fatty giving Betts a helping hand. There didn't seem to be anyone about. The children made their way cautiously to the cat house. The cats lay lazily on their benches, their blue eyes blinking at the children. Now," said Larry, "look for clues."
What sort of clues? whispered Betts. Don't know till we see some, said Larry. Look on the ground and all round about. See? This is where old Luke must have been working this afternoon. The boy pointed to where a barrow stood half full of weeds. A spade was stuck in the ground. Luke's coat hung on a tree nearby. He was digging over that bed, said Fatty thoughtfully. He couldn't have been working any nearer to the cat house than that. He would have seen anyone coming or going to the cats, wouldn't he? He couldn't have helped it. The children went and stood where Luke had been working. They could see every cat from where they stood. It would surely have been impossible to take a cat out and lock the door without being seen by Luke. And yet a cat had gone, and Luke swore he hadn't stolen her. So who in the wide world could have taken Dark Queen? Let's look all round the cat house and see if the cat could have escaped by herself, said Larry suddenly. Good idea, said Fatty. So they walked all round the strongly built wooden houses, which were set high on stout wooden legs, rather like modern hen houses. There's absolutely nowhere that a cat could get out, said Pip. Not a hole the size of a small mouse, even. Dark Queen certainly couldn't have escaped. She was taken out by somebody, that's certain. She was there at four o'clock when your mother and Miss Tremble saw her, but she was gone at five when Mr. Tapping and Clearorf came here. Said Daisy, and all that time Luke was working beside the cats. I simply don't understand what happened. Dark Queen must have disappeared by magic. Perhaps she did," said Bet seriously. "Magic is very powerful, isn't it? Perhaps." The others laughed at her. Bet went red. Well, Dark Queen either disappeared by magic, or she couldn't have been there at all," she said defiantly. Well. She was there because Mother saw her, idiot," said Pip. "I say, what's that?" He pointed to something that lay on the floor of the big cage in which all the cats lived. The children peered through the wire netting at it. There was a short silence. Then Fatty pursed up his lips, raised his eyebrows, and scratched his head. "Blow," he said. "I know what that is." It's one of those cunning little whistles that Luke is always making for Betts. It was. There it lay on the cage floor, a most tiresome and shocking clue. How could it have got there? Only one way. Luke must have been inside the cage and dropped the whistle. All the children felt suddenly puzzled and shocked. It wasn't Luke. It wasn't. It wasn't. Said Betts with tears in her voice. We all know it wasn't. Yes, we all know it wasn't. And yet, there in the cage is a whistle that only Luke could have dropped," said Fatty. "This is a very extraordinary mystery, I must say." Fatty, if Mister Goon sees that whistle, will he say it's a proper proof that Luke was the thief?" asked Betts anxiously. Fatty nodded. "Of course, it's an enormous, unmistakable clue, Betts." To someone like Clearoff, but it isn't a clue like that to you, is it, Fatty? Went on Betts, clutching his hand. Oh, Fatty, you don't think Luke dropped it, do you? I'll tell you what I think," said Fatty. "I think that somebody put it there so that Luke might be suspected. That's what I think." "Golly, I think you're right," said Larry. "This is getting very mysterious." I say. Do you think we ought to leave this clue for clear off to see? After all, we're pretty certain it's a false clue, aren't we? You're right," said Pip. "I vote we get the clue out and take it away." The five children stared at the whistle lying on the floor. The cage was locked. The key was gone. How could they get the whistle out? "We'll have to be quick," said Fatty desperately. "Clear off may be back in a short while. For goodness' sake!" How can we get that whistle out of the cage? Nobody knew. If the whistle had been a little nearer the wire netting, the children might have got some wire or a stick and worked it near enough to take out. But it was at the back of the cage. Then Fatty had one of his brain waves. He picked up a small pebble and shot it into the cage so that it rolled near the little whistle. One of the cats saw the pebble rolling and jumped down to play with it. She put out a paw and patted the pebble. 
Her paw touched the whistle and moved it. She began to play with the wooden whistle, too. The children watched breathlessly. The cat sent the pebble rolling away and went after it. Then she came back to the whistle and looked hard at it, as if she expected it to move. Then out went her paw again, and she gave the whistle a push. It rolled over and over, and the cat was delighted. She picked the whistle up cleverly in her two front paws, juggled with it a little, then let it drop. She struck it with her paw, and it flew through the air, landing quite near to the wire netting. Oh, good, good, good! said Fatty joyfully. He took a small roll of wire from his pocket. It was wonderful the things that Fatty kept in his pockets. He undid a length of the wire, twisted two pieces together, and made a small loop at one end. Then he pushed the wire through one of the holes in the netting. Everyone watched eagerly. The wire reached the whistle. Fatty jiggled it about patiently, trying to fit the loop at the end over the whistle. The cat that had played with the whistle watched with great interest. Then suddenly it put out a playful paw and patted the wire, sending the loop neatly over the whistle. Oh, thanks, Puss, said Fatty gleefully, and drew the whistle carefully to the wire netting. He jerked it up, and the whistle flew through one of the holes and landed at Betsy's feet. She picked it up. Got it, said Fatty. Let's have a look at it. Yes, it's one of Luke's, all right. What a good thing we got it out. Now that clue won't be found by old Clearorf. Luke won't get into further trouble because of that. You really are clever, Fatty, said Bats in the greatest admiration. Good work, Fatty, said Pip. Fatty at once swelled up with pride and importance. Oh, that's nothing, he began. I've often had better ideas than this. Why, once? Shut up! Said Larry, Daisy, and Pip together. Fatty shut up. He stuffed the whistle into his pocket. Look about for any more clues, said Pip. There might be some more in the cage. The five of them pressed their noses once more to the cage netting. Bets wrinkled up her nose. I don't like the smell in the cage, she said. Well, animals never smell very nice when they're caged, said Larry. No, it's another smell. Said Bets, like petrol or something. They all sniffed. She means turpentine, said Fatty. I can smell it too, quite faintly. Afraid that's not a clue, though, Bets. Still, it's good to notice even a smell. Perhaps Miss Harmer uses turps to clean out the cage. Now, any other clue, anybody? But there really did not seem to be anything at all to be found. Although the children hunted around the cages and peered inside them time and again, sickening," said Fatty. "Nothing to help us at all, not a thing. Well, it's a jolly good thing we found that whistle before Mister Tapping or Clearoff spotted it. I feel certain somebody put it there so that Luke might be suspected of stealing the cat. What a mean trick to play! I wish we could put a whole lot of clues in the cage so that it would muddle up old Clearoff," said Pip. The others stared at him in delight. The same delicious thought striking them all at the same moment. "Golly, what a marvelous idea!" said Fatty, wishing he had thought of it himself. "Yes, let's do it," said Larry excitedly. "Let's put all kinds of silly clues that couldn't possibly point to Luke. It will give old Clearoff a most frightful headache sorting them all out." They began to giggle. What should they push into the cage? I've got some peppermint drops," said Pip with a chuckle. "I'll chuck one into the cage, and I'll put a piece of my hair ribbon in," said Daisy. "It tore in half today, and I've got the bits in my pocket. I'll put a half bit in through the wire." "And I've got some blue buttons off my doll's coat," said Bets. "I'll put one of those in." "I believe I've got a new pair of brown shoelaces somewhere in my pocket," said Larry, digging about in his shorts pockets. "Yes." Here they are. I'll put one into the cage. What will you put in, Fatty? Asked Bets. Fatty produced a collection of spent matches out of his pocket. The others stared at them in amazement. What do you want to collect used matches for? Asked Larry at last. They're the ones left by my father in the ashtray in the living room after he's lit a fire or some candles. You never know when they might be useful. 
"I shall throw a dead match under the cage on the ground," he said, "and one inside the cage, though I hope none of the cats will chew it and get ill. Two matchsticks will just about send old Clear off off his head." Very solemnly, the five children spread their clues. Pip threw a large round peppermint drop into the cage, where the cats eyed it with displeasure. They evidently disapproved of the smell. Daisy stuffed half a bit of rather grubby blue hair ribbon into the netting. Bets put in a small blue button. Larry pushed in one of his new brown shoelaces, and Fatty threw a matchstick under the cage and one inside as well. There, he said, plenty of clues for old Clearoff to find. Hope he comes soon. Chapter Nine. Mr. Goon on the job. I say," said Daisy suddenly, watching her hair ribbon flap on the floor of the cage in a little draught from under the door. "I say, I hope no one will think I've stolen the cat. Mother would know that was a piece of my hair ribbon if ever she saw it. Oh, crumbs! I never thought of that," said Pip. "It's all right," said Fatty. "I've got a big envelope here. See." Now then, let's each put into the envelope the same thing that we've already settled for clues. I'll put in two matchsticks to match the ones I've left. Daisy, put in your other half of ribbon. Daisy did so. Then Betts put in one of the blue doll's buttons. Larry put in the other shoelace, and Pip put in a peppermint drop. Fatty folded up the envelope carefully and put it into his pocket. If any of us is accused of the theft because of the clues we put in the cage. We've only got to show them what's in this envelope for them to know we did it for a joke," he said. Bets heard her mother call her and gave a groan. "It's my bedtime, Blow. I don't want to go." "You must," said Pip. "You got into a row yesterday for being late. Oh dear, I do wish we could stay here and see old Clearoff and Mister Tupping finding the clues we've left." "Well, let's," said Larry. "Oh, me too." Wailed Bets, afraid of being left out again. Pip gave her a push. Bets, you must go. There's Mummy calling again. Well, she must be calling you too. It means you've got to come in and get ready for supper," said Bets. "You know it does." Pip did know it. Larry gave a sigh. He knew that he and Daisy ought to go home too. They had further to go than Pip and Bets. We'll have to go too," said Larry. Fatty, I suppose you couldn't possibly stay and watch, could you? It really would be funny to see. Why don't you stay? Your parents don't usually call you this early. All right, I'll stay here and watch," said Fatty. "I think I'll climb that tree there. It's easy to climb, and the leaves are nice and thick. I can see everything well from up there and not be seen myself." Well, come on then, Bets," said Pip, not at all wanting to go. Fatty was going to have all the fun. Then there came the sound of men's voices up the garden, and the children looked at one another at once. "It's Mister Tupping and Clearoff coming back," whispered Larry. "Over the wall, quick!" "Goodbye, Fatty. See you tomorrow sometime," said Pip in a low voice. The four ran quietly to the wall. Pip gave Bets a leg up and got her safely over. The others were soon safely on the other side. Fatty was left by himself. He shinned up the tree very quickly. Fatty sat on a broad bough and carefully parted the leaves so that he could see what was going on down below. He saw Mister Tupping coming towards the cat house with Clearoff. Well, now, Clearoff said, "We'll just have a look round, Mister Tupping. You never know when there's clues about, you know. Ah, many a clue I've found that's led me straight to the criminal." Ah, said Mister Tupping wisely. I believe you, Mister Goon. Well, I shouldn't be surprised if that boy Luke hasn't left something behind. He may be clever enough to steal a valuable cat, but he wouldn't be clever enough to hide his tracks. The two men began to hunt carefully round and about the cat house. The Siamese cats watched them out of brilliant blue eyes. They could not imagine why so many people came to their shed that day. Fatty looked down at the hunters. Carefully peering between the leaves, 
Mr. Goon found the matchstick under the cat house first. He pounced on it swiftly and held it up. What's that? asked Mr. Tupping in astonishment. Matchstick, said Mr. Goon with great satisfaction. Then he looked puzzled and tilted back his helmet to scratch his head. Does that boy Luke use matches? he asked. Don't be silly, said Mr. Tupping impatiently. Course not. That's not a clue. Somebody who came with Lady Candling to see her cats must have chucked his matchstick away under the house, that's all. Hmm, said Mr. Goon, not at all wanting to dismiss the matchstick like that. Well, I'll have to think about that. Fatty giggled to himself. The two men went on searching. Mr. Tupping straightened himself up at last. Don't seem nothing else to be found, he said. I suppose there wouldn't be anything in the cat house to see, do you think? Mr. Goon looked doubtful. Shouldn't think so, he said. But we might look. Got the key, Mr. Tapping. Mr. Tapping took the key down from a nail at the back of the cat house. But before he had unlocked the door, Mr. Goon gave a loud exclamation. He had looked through the wire netting of the cat house and had seen various things on the floor that caused him great excitement. Why, the place seemed to be alive with clues. What's up? asked Mr. Tapping. Oh, look here. See that shoelace there? said Mr. Goon, pointing. That's a whopping big clue, that is. Somebody's been in there and lost his shoelace. Mr. Tupping stared at the shoelace in the greatest astonishment. Then he saw the blue button and the hair ribbon. He gave a gasp of surprise. He inserted the key in the lock and opened the door. The two men collected the clues from the cat house. They brought them out to look at them. Whoever went in there wore shoes with brown laces, that's certain, said Mr. Goon with great satisfaction. And look at that there button. That's come off somebody's coat, that has. What's this? asked Mr. Tapping, showing Mr. Goon Pip's peppermint drop. Mr. Goon sniffed at it. <laughs> peppermint, he said. Now, does that boy Luke suck peppermints? I expect so said Mr. Tupping. Most boys eat sweets. But Luke don't wear a hair ribbon, Mr. Goon. And look, there's another matchstick, like the one you found under the house. Mr. Goon soon lost his excitement over his finds and became puzzled. He gazed at his clues in silence. Hmm. Judging by these here clues, the thief ought by rights to be someone that uses matches wears blue hair ribbons and blue buttons, sucks peppermint drops, and has brown laces in his shoes, he said. It don't make sense. Fatty was trying his hardest not to giggle out loud. It was so funny seeing Mr. Goon and Mr. Tupping puzzle their heads over all the clues that the children had so carefully left for them to find. Mr. Goon cautiously licked the peppermint drop. Yes, it's peppermint right enough, he said. Well, this is a fair puzzler, finding all these clues and nobody we can fit them to, so to speak. You finding anything else, Mr. Tupping? Mr. Tupping had gone into the cat house and was looking all round it again, very, very carefully. Just looking to see if there's any clue we've overlooked, he said. But he couldn't seem to find anything else, however hard he hunted. He came out again, looking rather untidy and cross. Well... There don't seem much else to be found, he said, sounding very disappointed. I'm sure you'll find it's that boy Luke, Mr. Goon, that's the thief. These clues can't be clues, just things that got into the cage by accident. Well, a peppermint drop seems a funny sort of thing to get into the cage by accident, said Mr. Goon grumpily. I'll have to take all these things home and think about them. Fatty chuckled deep down in himself as he watched Mr. Goon put his clues into a clean white envelope, lick it up, write something on it, and put it carefully into his pocket. He turned to Mr. Tupping. Well, so long, he said. Thanks for your help. It's that boy Luke, no doubt about it. I've told him I'll go along and give him a thorough questioning tomorrow, and if I don't force a confession out of him, my name's not Theophilus Goon. And with that mouthful of a name, 
old Clearorf departed majestically down the path, his clues safely in his pocket, his mind puzzling them over. A hair ribbon. Very strange. A blue button. Most peculiar. A brown shoelace, quite new. Most extraordinary. A peppermint drop. Most bewildering. And two matchsticks. Two. Mr. Goon felt that if there had just been one, it would have been easier. Why should a thief stand and use two matches whilst stealing a cat? Fatty longed to get down the tree, go home and have some supper. He suddenly felt tremendously hungry. He peered down to see if Mr. Tupping had gone. But he hadn't. He was in the cat house again, hunting about very carefully. After a while he came out, looking thoughtful, locked the house and went off up the path, still looking thoughtful. Fatty waited till his footsteps had died away, then slithered down the tree. He jumped down to the path and looked in at the blue-eyed cats. He was glad he had Luke's whistle in his pocket. That really would have been a clue. Fatty chuckled when he thought of Mr. Goon's delight and surprise at finding so many clues. Well, we'll see old Luke tomorrow and ask him no end of questions, thought Fatty as he went home. My word, this has been an exciting day. But there were more exciting things to come. Chapter 10 Pip and Bets Pay a Call Next morning, Fatty was down at Pip's house early, longing to tell the others how surprised and puzzled Mr. Goon and the gardener had been when they had found all the false clues. Larry and Daisy arrived about the same time as Buster and Fatty, and soon the children were giggling over Fatty's story. Clear off asked Mr. Tubbing if Luke used matches said Fatty with a chuckle. I almost fell out of the tree trying not to laugh. We've whistled lots of times to Luke this morning, said Pip, but he hasn't answered us or come to the wall either. Do you think he's too frightened to? Perhaps he is, said Fatty. Well, we simply must talk to him and tell him about the whistle we found in the cat's cage and all the clues we put there ourselves. I'll go and whistle loudly. But not even Fatty's loudest and most vigorous whistling brought any answer. So the children decided to wait at the gate about one o'clock. That was the time when Luke went home to his dinner. So they waited at the gate. But no Luke appeared. The children waited until ten minutes past one, and then had to rush off to their own meal. Perhaps he's got the sack, said Fatty, the idea occurring to him for the first time. Perhaps he won't come next door any more. Oh, said Betts in dismay. Poor Luke. Do you think Lady Candling gave him notice then and said he wasn't to come any more? How shall we find out? said Larry. We could ask Mr. Tupping, said Daisy doubtfully. The others looked at her scornfully. As if we'd go and ask Mr. Tupping anything, said Larry. They all stood and thought for a moment. I know said Pip. Lady Candling said I could take Bets in to see her, so I will this afternoon, and I could ask Lady Candling herself about Luke, couldn't I? Good idea, Pip, said Fatty. I was just thinking the same thing myself, and also you could take the chance of finding out where Lady Candling was between four and five o'clock, perhaps. I mean, find out whether she had any chance of slipping off down to the cats herself to steal her own Dark Queen away. Well, I'm sure she didn't, said Pip at once. You've only got to look at her to know she couldn't even think of doing such a thing. Anyway, I thought we had decided that it wasn't worthwhile questioning our suspects, seeing that Luke was by the cat house all the time during that hour and would have seen anyone there. Well, I suppose it isn't really, said Fatty. I don't see that it's any way possible for the thief to have stolen the cat right under old Luke's nose. He said that he hadn't left the spot for even half a minute. It really is our dinner time, said Bats. Come on, Pip, we shall get into an awful row. Come back afterwards, you others, and we'll tell you how Pip and I get on this afternoon. They parted and went home to their various meals. They were all worried about Luke. Had he lost his job? Lady Candling must have given him notice, or surely he would have been back as usual in the morning. Poor old Luke. 
At half past three, Pip and Betts thought they would go and see Lady Candley. Daisy looked at Betts. The little girl had on very grubby clothes, and Pip's trousers were extremely dirty. Don't you think you ought to put on clean clothes, Betts? said Daisy. And just look at your trousers, Pip. Honestly, you look as if you've been sitting down on a rubbish heap or something. Golly, have we got to go and change? said Pip in alarm. He hated getting into clean things. Well, I think it would be more polite to Lady Candling if you went looking clean, said Daisy. So poor Pip and Betts went into the house to wash and put on clean clothes. Their mother saw them going indoors and called out to them, "What do you want?" "We're just going to wash and put on clean clothes, Mummy," said Betts. "What?" said her mother in amazement. "Whatever has come over you? Where are you going in your clean clothes?" "To see Lady Candling," said Betts before Pip could stop her. "To see Lady Candling." Said Mrs. Hilton, even more astonished. But why? She hasn't asked you in. You can't go without being asked. By this time, Pip had given Betts such a nudge that she nearly fell over. Betts stood looking at her mother, afraid that she had given away something she shouldn't have mentioned. Well, Betts seems to have lost her tongue," said Mrs. Hilton impatiently. "Pip, what is all this about?" It isn't like you to go rushing off paying afternoon calls with Betts. What's come over you? Well, mother," said Pip, "I saw Lady Candling yesterday, and she said you had spoken about Betts to her, and would I bring her in to see her, as she liked little girls. But when did you see Lady Candling?" said his mother, astonished. "Oh, Pip, I do hope you haven't been going into next door and making a lot of trouble there." "Oh no, mother," said Pip, looking very innocent. I wouldn't dream of making trouble. Well, we won't go if you rather we didn't. But Betts will be awfully disappointed now. Well, go then," said Mrs. Hilton hastily. "But do behave yourselves. I thought it would be nice to tell Lady Candling we were sorry about her lost cat and ask her if she had found it yet," said Pip. His mother stared at him. It doesn't seem like you to get so polite and considerate all of a sudden, Pip," she said. "I can't help feeling there's something behind all this. Well, if I hear from Lady Candling that you have been making a nuisance of yourself, I shall be very cross." The children escaped to change into clean things. Betts was afraid that Pip was going to scold her for saying they were going to see Lady Candling, but he didn't. Soon. They were walking sedately down the drive, out of the gate, and up Lady Candling's drive. They passed Mister Tupping on the way. He was cutting the hedges there. He scowled at them as they passed. Good afternoon, Mister Tupping. What a beautiful day it is," said Pip, in an imitation of his mother's politeness. "I really think we shall have a little rain before long, though, don't you? Still, the vegetable garden needs it, I'm sure." Mr. Tupping gave a growl and snipped viciously at the hedge. Pip felt sure he would like to have snipped at him and Betts. He grinned and went on his way. The two children went to the front door and rang the bell. A young maid came to the door and smiled at the children. "Please, is Lady Candling in?" asked Pip. "I think she's in the garden," said the maid. "I'll take you out to the veranda and you can go and look for her if you like. She may be picking roses." Have they found the cat yet? Asked Pip as he and Betts followed the maid out to a sunny veranda. No, said the maid. Miss Harmer's in a great state about her. It's a funny business, isn't it? I'm afraid it must have been Luke. After all, he was the only one near the cats between four and five o'clock. Didn't you hear or see anyone strange at all yesterday afternoon? Asked Pip, thinking that he might as well ask a few questions. Nobody, said the maid. You see, Lady Candling had quite a tea party yesterday, nine or ten people altogether, and Cook and I were busy all the time. We didn't go down the garden at all between four and five o'clock. We had such a lot to do. If we had slipped down, we might have seen the thief at his work. Oh, it was a good day for the thief, with Miss Harmer out and Mister Tupping out and Cook and me busy and Lady Candling up here at the house with her friends. It was," said Pip. It looks as if the thief must have known all that too to arrange his theft so neatly. 
That's why we think it must be Luke," said the girl. "Though I always liked Luke, a bit slow, but always very kind. And that Mister Tapping's a perfect horror to him. Don't you like Mister Tapping either?" said Bets eagerly. "He's a rude, bad-tempered old man," said the girl. "But don't you say I said so. Cook and me wish it had been him that took the cat. Well." I mustn't talk to you any more. You go out and find her ladyship. Pip and Bets went into the sunny garden. From what that maid says, it's quite clear that we can cross Lady Candling, the maid, and the cook off our list of suspects," said Pip. "Hello, there's Miss Tremble." Miss Tremble advanced to meet them. Bets spoke to Pip in a whisper. "Pip, let's count how many times her glasses fall off. They keep doing it." Well, children," said Miss Trimble in her bird-like voice, giving them a wide and toothy smile. "Are you looking for Lady Candling? <laughs> I think I have seen this little girl before, haven't I? Aren't you the little girl that the Strawberry Runners ran away with? <laughs> What a joke!" <laughs> She laughed, and her glasses fell off, dangling on their little chain. She put them on again. "Yes, I'm the little girl," said Bets. And we have come to see Lady Candling. Oh, what a pity! She's just gone out," said Miss Trimble. "I'm afraid you'll have to put up with poor old me." She laughed again, and her glasses fell off. Twice," said Bets under her breath. "Do you know where Luke is?" said Pip, thinking it would be a good idea to go and find him if he was anywhere about. "No, I don't," said Miss Trimble. He didn't turn up today. Mister Tapping was very annoyed about it. Did Lady Candling give Luke the sack, Miss Tremble? Asked Bets. <laughs> My name is Tremble, not Tremble," said Miss Tremble. No, Lady Candling didn't give him notice. At least I don't think so. Wasn't it a pity about that lovely cat? I saw her at four o'clock, you know. Yes, you were with my mother," said Pip. I suppose you didn't see anyone near the cat house except Luke. No, nobody," said Miss Trimble. Luke was there, of course, digging hard all the time. Your mother and I were only there a minute or two, and then I had to hurry her back to the tea table because there was a lot for me to do there. I didn't have a moment to myself until after the party. Then you couldn't have stolen the cat," said Pip with a laugh. Miss Trimble jumped, and her glasses fell off. Her nose went even redder than it already was. <laughs> What a funny joke," she said, and she tried to disentangle her glasses from her lace collar. <laughs> The very idea of stealing anything makes me go hot and cold. Could we go and see the cats, Miss Tremble? Asked Bets. I should think so," said Miss Tremble. My name is Tremble, not Tremble. <laughs> Do try and remember. Miss Harmer is with the cats. We'll go and see her. Come along, dears. She tripped along in front of them, her glasses on her nose once more. They fell off going down a few steps, and Bets counted out loud. That's four times. Four times what, dear? Said Miss Trimble, turning round and smiling sweetly. She put up her hand to stop her glasses from falling. Don't stop them, said Bets. I'm counting how many times they fall off. Oh, what a funny little girl," said Miss Trimble, looking rather cross. She held her glasses on with her hand, and Bets was sorry. She felt that wasn't fair. They came to the cat house. Miss Harmer was there mixing some food. She looked up. Her plump, jolly face looked worried. "Hello," she said. "Come to see my cats." "Yes, please," said Bets. Miss Harmer, wasn't it awful, Dark Queen being stolen whilst you were away? Yes," said Miss Harmer, stirring the food in the pan. "I wish I hadn't gone. I should only have taken half a day, really. But Mister Tupping offered to look after the cats for me if I'd like the whole day, so I thanked him and went. But I've reproached myself ever since. Mister Tupping offered to look after the cats, did you say?" said Pip. Full of amazement at the thought of Mister Tupping offering to do anyone a kindness, golly, that's not like him. No, it isn't," said the girl with a laugh. 
but I badly wanted to go home, and I can't unless I have a whole day because my home is so far away. Do you collect railway tickets? Because the collector didn't take my ticket when I got back to the station last night. You can have it if you like. Pip did collect railway tickets. He took the return half that Miss Harmer held out to him. Thanks, he said. I'd like it. He put it into his pocket, thinking how envious Larry would be, for he collected railway tickets too. Do you think Luke stole the cat, Miss Harmer? said Pip. No, I don't, said Miss Harmer. He's a bit silly, but he's honest enough. But I tell you who might have taken the cat. That circus friend of Luke's. What's his name now? Jake, I think it is. This was news to the two children. Luke had never told them about Jake. A circus friend. How exciting. Why had Luke never mentioned him? Does Jake live near here? asked Pip. Oh, no, but the circus he belongs to is performing in the next town, in Farring, said Miss Harmer. So I suppose he's somewhere near. You know, Dark Queen would be marvellous in a circus. I had already taught her to do a few tricks. Miss Trimble was getting impatient, for it was near her tea time. She gave three or four polite little coughs, and her glasses promptly fell off. We'd better go, said Pip. Thanks for showing us the cats. You needn't bother to show us out, Miss Tremble. We'll go over the wall. My name is Trimble, not Tremble, said Miss Trimble, losing her smile for a moment. I wish you would try and remember. <laughs> and surely you should not go over the wall. Let me take you down the drive. Mr. Tupping's there, said Betts. Miss Trimble's glasses fell off at once at the mention of the surly gardener. Oh, well. <laughs> If you really want to get over the wall, I won't stop you, she said. Goodbye, dear children. I'll tell Lady Candling you came. They fell off eight times, said Betts in a pleased tone as the two of them climbed over the wall. I say, Piv, isn't it funny that Luke never told us about Jake? Chapter 11 A Visit to the Circus Pip and Betts were to go to tea with Larry and Daisy that afternoon, so they all went up the lane together, Fatty and Buster too. Pip had a lot to tell. Luke hasn't turned up today, he said. It's funny, isn't it, because Lady Candling hasn't given him notice. And I say, I wonder why he never told us about Jake. I suppose, I suppose he couldn't possibly have told Jake to come to the cat house yesterday, and he couldn't possibly have given him the cat, could he? said Larry. I mean, I know we think Luke didn't do it, but, well, what do you others think? For the first time, a small doubt about Luke came into the children's minds. He hadn't told them about Jake, and he was a man they would have liked to hear about if he lived with the circus. And after all, Luke had been the only one near the cat house during the whole of that hour. Well, I still don't believe it was Luke or his friend Jake said Betts stoutly. So there. Nor do I, said Daisy. But I wish everything wasn't so dreadfully puzzling. We were much better find out as last time, said Larry gloomily. Think of the clues and things we found, and all the suspects we questioned. Well, said Pitt, I can tell you this. All the suspects on our list can be crossed off now. I was only about half an hour in next door, but I found out enough to know that not one of the people on our list could have stolen Dark Queen. How do you know? asked Fatty. Well, Lady Candling had quite a big party, said Pip, and it stands to reason she couldn't leave a big party and go off to steal her own cat in the middle of it. The cook and maid were very busy all the time during the tea hour, so that rules them out too. Miss Tremble had to help as well, and I'm sure Lady Candling would have been very suspicious if she'd gone off for ten minutes or so to steal the cat. Go on, Pip, said Fatty. Where's your list of suspects, Larry? Let's cross them off one by one. And you can cross off Miss Harmer, said Pip, because she went home yesterday, and her home is at Langston, miles away. And look, here's the return half she gave me, because the collector didn't take it when she got back, so we can cross her off too. That's all the suspects crossed off, except Luke, said Larry. Golly, it does look as if it might have been a friend of Luke's, doesn't it? 
someone who came slipping up, winked at Luke, took the cat and went off, trusting to Luke not to give him away. I wish we could find Luke and question him about Jake. I know where Luke is. I bet I know, said Pip. I bet he's gone to the circus and he's with his friend Jake. I bet he'll go off with the circus too when it moves away. Everyone felt certain that Pip was right. Of course that was where Luke would be. Look here. Let's get out our bikes after tea and ride over to Farring, said Fatty. We'll soon find the circus tents, and if Luke's there, we'll find him too. Good idea, said everyone, brightening up at the thought of doing something exciting. Come on, let's hurry up over tea and go. Mrs. Dakin, Larry's mother and Daisy's, was astonished to find the children galloping so fast through the lovely tea she had provided for them. She looked at them in astonishment. Are you terribly hungry or just in a hurry? She asked. Didn't any of you have any dinner? We're just in a hurry, Mrs. Dakin. That's all," said Fatty, as politely as he could with his mouth full. "We want to go for a bike ride after tea." To Farring," put in Bets. She got two hard nudges at once: one from Pip and one from Larry. They were both afraid she would say too much. "Why to Farring?" said Mrs. Dakin, surprised. She didn't know the circus was there. It's not a very pretty place. Well, we thought it would be quite a nice ride there and back," said Larry. "We'd better be going now. We won't be back late, Mummy." Fatty had to go and get his bicycle, and so had Bets and Pip. To her joy, Bets was allowed to come, as Farring was not a great distance away. The children rode off excitedly. Soon, in front of them, they saw another cyclist, a big burly one dressed in dark blue. Golly, there's old Clear off," said Pip. "Don't catch him up, anyone. He may turn off somewhere, and then we can get on quickly on our way to Farring." But Clear off took the way to Farring too. "I say, I hope he isn't going to see Jake as well," said Fatty in dismay. "Do you suppose he got out of Luke that he had a circus friend? Blow! We can't let Clear off get ahead of us like this. After all, Jake may be a fine big clue." Then a lovely thing happened. Mister Goon got a puncture. He rode over a piece of glass, and his back tire went flat quite suddenly. The big policeman bumped along the road, gave a loud and angry exclamation, and got off. He took his bike to the side of the road and got out a puncture mending outfit. The children, grinning, rode quickly by. Fatty waved to him. "Evening, Mister Goon. Sorry to see you were in trouble." The policeman looked up in surprise that turned to annoyance when he saw the five children cycling quickly on the way to Farring. He began to mend his inner tube. The children simply sped along, knowing that they had at least a quarter of an hour before Clearoff could catch them up. There's the circus tents," said Bets as they topped a hill and rode down. And look at the cages too, and the bright caravans. Oh, I do think it looks exciting. It was exciting. Seven beautiful black horses were being ridden round the field by the grooms, who were giving them a little exercise. Smoke rose from the chimneys of the bright caravans, and all kinds of exciting smells rose on the air. Kippers," said Bets, wrinkling up her nose. "Sausages," said Daisy. "Stew," said Fatty. "Oh, I had a good tea, but I could do with a good supper as well." What's our plan? Said Larry, jumping off his bicycle and leaning it against the fence. Do we hunt round for Luke, or do we ask for Jake? We better not all go," said Fatty. "I think I'd better go by myself and just ask politely for Jake." "I'm the head of the find outers," said Larry. "I'll go." "I thought of the circus idea and that Luke might be here," said Pip. "I think I ought to go." "Buck up and decide," said Daisy impatiently. Clearoff will be here soon. Well, we'll all go except Bets," said Larry. "It can't matter us wandering separately round the field. I can see other children doing it too, but Bets had better stay and look after the bikes." Well," began Bets indignantly. "I like that. Why should I?" "You know you're afraid of tigers," said Pip. 
and you're afraid of elephants too. You wouldn't ride one when you went to the zoo. Oh, said Bats. Well, I will stay here then, but I think it's mean of you all to go all the same. The little girl had tears in her eyes. She knew she would not dare go into the circus camp by herself, but she did think one of the others could have stayed to guard the bikes with her. The others climbed over the fence and went into the field. They separated and wandered about, waiting to meet someone they could ask about Jake. It was Pip who found Jake. He had asked a young circus girl if she knew where Jake was, and she had pointed to where a big man was giving a pail of water to a horse. Pip went across to him. The man looked up. "What do you want?" he said. "Excuse me," said Pip. "I'm looking for a boy I know called Luke. I've got a message for him. Is he here?" "No,"、nope, said the man shortly. "I haven't seen him for weeks." Pip was disappointed. "Oh," he said, "I did want to talk to him. You don't know his address, do you?" "No,"、nope, said the man again. I don't give addresses to little busybodies. You go away and mind your own business. Fatty came up when he saw Pip talking to the man. "Is this Jake?" he said to Pip. Pip nodded. "But he says he hasn't seen Luke for weeks," said Pip. "We're his friends," said Fatty earnestly. "Please believe us. We just want to talk to him." "I've told you I don't know where he is," said the man. "Now you get out of this field." And just remember what I say. I haven't seen Luke for weeks. Bets stood by the bicycles, watching the others wandering about the camp. She kept an eye open for Old Clearoff and hoped he wouldn't stop and ask her what she was doing there if he came by. She decided to creep through to the other side of the hedge, where she would be hidden from any passerby. So she crept through and settled herself comfortably there. She was near a bright red caravan. She looked up at it. And saw something that gave her an enormous surprise. Somebody was peeping at her from behind the little lace curtain, and that somebody was Luke. Chapter Twelve. Luke again. Bets sat quite still, holding her breath. The curtain was then drawn a little further, and the window was quietly opened. Luke put his head out. Hello, little Bets," he said in a cautious voice. "Why are you here? Have you come to see the circus?" "No," said Bets, standing up and speaking in a low voice too. "We heard you had a friend here, Luke, and we wanted to find you and talk to you. So we thought perhaps you had gone to your friend." "He's my uncle," said Luke. "I don't like him much, but I couldn't think of anyone else to go to. You see." I was afraid they put me into prison for stealing Dark Queen, so I ran away. But you didn't steal her, did you? Said Bets. Course not, said Luke. As if I'd go stealing anything. Are you alone? No, the others are here too, said Bets. They have gone to find Jake to ask if you are here. Oh, said Luke. Well, I didn't tell him anything about the trouble I'm in. Nothing about Dark Queen, I mean. I was afraid if I told him that he'd not hide me here. I just told him I'd got into trouble with my stepfather and wanted to run away with the circus. He said he'd hide me till the circus went away and take me with him. He can do with a strong lad like me to help. Was your stepfather very angry? Said Bats with great sympathy. Oh, Luke, you do have a bad time, don't you? I hope the others don't say anything to Jake about the stolen cat, but I don't think they will. They were only going to say that they wanted to give you a message. Well, if they tell him I'm suspected of stealing anything, he'll not keep me here. That's certain," said Luke. "No circus folk like to be mixed up with the police. Don't you go and tell anyone I'm here, will you, Bets? I've got to keep hidden in this caravan till the circus moves off. I won't tell a soul, except the boys and Daisy," said Bets. "You can depend on that." Oh, Luke, whoever do you think can have stolen the cat? It went between four and five o'clock, you know, and you were there all the time. Didn't you see anyone? No, no one," said Luke. "It's a real puzzler. That's what it is." Oh, and Luke, I must tell you something strange," said Bats, remembering the finding of the whistle. But before she could say any more, there came the sound of voices nearby. 
Luke shut the window hastily and drew the curtain. It was only the boys and Daisy coming back to Betts, bitterly disappointed. Nothing doing, Betts, said Fatty. We found Jake, and he wouldn't open his mouth about Luke at all. Said he hadn't seen him for weeks. But all the same, I can't help feeling that he has seen him and that he knows where he is, said Pip. It's sickening, coming all this way for nothing. What's the matter with Betts? said Fatty, looking at her suddenly. She's all red and bursting to tell us something. What's up, Betts? Nothing, said Betts. Except that I know where Luke is, that's all. The four children stared at Betts as if she had suddenly gone mad. What do you mean? said Pip at last. Where is he? Betts dropped her voice. See that red caravan over there? Well, he's hiding in there. I saw him. He was peeping out at me, and I talked to him. Crumbs, said Larry. Here we go, wandering all over the field, finding Jake and not getting a word out of him, and all the time little Betts is talking to Luke. Whatever will she do next? Betts glowed. It was just a bit of luck that she had crept through the hedge and sat down beside the red caravan. She knew that, but all the same she couldn't help feeling rather clever and important. Did you say anything to Jake about the stolen cat? asked Betts. Because Luke said he didn't say a word to him about that in case Jake wouldn't hide him. He just told Jake that he was running away from his stepfather. We didn't say a word about the cat, of course not, said Pip. I wonder if we can speak to Luke. Which window did he look out of, did you say? Betts showed him. Pip whistled the little tune that Luke always used as a signal. The curtain moved slightly. And the children could see the outline of Luke's head behind. The window softly opened. Hello there, Luke, said Fatty in a low voice. We haven't said anything to Jake about the cat. I say, are you really running away with the circus? Yes, said Luke. But don't you think that everyone will feel certain you stole Dark Queen if you run away? said Larry. You know, it's not a very good plan to run away from things. There came the sound of somebody jumping off a bicycle the other side of the hedge, somebody heavy and panting. The children looked at one another and then looked over the hedge. Yes, just as they had feared, it was Mr. Goon. His puncture was mended and he had caught them up. These your bikes, said Mr. Goon. What are you doing here? Having a look round the circus, said Fatty politely. Lovely tigers here, Mr. Goon. Mr. Goon snorted. You better clear off, he said. You're up to no good here, I'll be bound. Have you seen your friend Luke? Luke? said Fatty, staring with wide eyes at Mr. Goon. Why? Where is Luke? Isn't he at Lady Candling's? We'd like to talk to him if only you'll tell us where he is. Mr. Goon snorted again. He had a very good snort. Fatty wished he could snort like Mr. Goon. He was sure the boys at his school would love to hear a snort like that. You clear off, said Mr. Goon again, getting on his bicycle. Butting in where you're not wanted, interfering with the law. He rode off to the gate that led into the field. The children did not dare to speak to Luke again. They slipped through the hedge and got their bikes. They saw Mr. Goon speak to someone and then go off to where Jake was still watering his horses. There! Just what we thought, said Fatty. He's heard about Jake too. I only hope Jake won't give away Luke's hiding place when he knows he's suspected of stealing Dark Queen. We'd better get away from this caravan, said Pip. It might look funny being so near it. Old Clearoff is a bit slow, but it might occur to him that we are interested in this caravan for some special reason. So they all rode off, leaving poor Luke behind in the red caravan. How they wished they could do something for him, but they couldn't. They must just hope he could get away safely with Jake and that nobody would find him. All the same, I think he's jumped out of the frying pan into the fire, said Larry as they cycled home together. I don't think he's going to be any happier with that surly Jake than with Mr. Tupping or his stepfather. It was late when they got back, almost Betsy's bedtime. We'd better say good night, said Larry. Stopping at the corner of the road where he lived. See you all tomorrow. Good night, called the others and rode on, leaving Daisy and Larry behind. 
We'll drop you next, Fatty," said Pip. "I say, isn't it a pity that this new mystery doesn't seem to be coming to anything? Luke's run away, and now we shall never know who stole Dark Queen. Yes, this mystery is at an end, I suppose, as far as we are concerned," said Fatty, jumping off his bike as he came to his house. With Luke gone away, old Goon will have to drop his inquiries, and I don't expect we shall ever find out any more. It's a pity. Goodbye," said Betts. "See you tomorrow." She and Pip rode home down the lane. Mummy was just calling Betts as she rode up the drive. "Just in time," said Pip. "You won't get into a row tonight, that's certain. Happy dreams, Betts." Betts went off to the bathroom to have her bath. Pip went to clean up and change his clothes. He whistled as he changed. He found that he was whistling the tune Luke always used. Poor old Luke," thought Pip, scrubbing his nails. "I suppose we'll never hear of him again. Well, I shall always remember him because of those lovely whistles he made." Pip had his meal and then went out to clean his bike. He did not go to bed until half past eight, so he had plenty of time. He cleaned his bike and then went down to the end of the garden. There was an old summer house. Pip took a book and sat there reading. He thought he heard a rustling noise once or twice, and he looked up, wondering if there was a bird in the bushes outside. But there seemed to be nothing, and Pip went on reading. Then he heard the clock in the village nearby strike the half hour, and he shut his book. He went to find his mother and father to say good night to them. Pip was tired. He soon fell asleep. He dreamt all kinds of things. He dreamt that old Clearoff was chasing him, riding on Buster's back. He dreamt that Jake joined in, riding on a tiger. Then he dreamt that Luke was in front of them, running away in fright. He heard the tuneful whistle that Luke used as a signal. Pip turned in his sleep. The dream went on. Luke was in it all the time. The whistle kept there too, insistent and clear. Then someone clutched Pip, and he awoke with a terrible jump. He sat up, trembling, still thinking of his dream. He gave a little yelp. Shh! It's me, Pip," said Betts's voice. "Don't make a noise." Betts," said Pip in anger. "What do you mean by giving me a fright like this? You nearly made me jump out of my skin." Pip, listen. There's someone whistling in the garden," whispered Betts. "And it's Luke's little tune. You know, the one we always use to whistle to one another. Do you think it's Luke out there? Does he want us?" Pip was now wide awake. He was just about to answer Betts when he heard the whistle again—the noise he had heard in his dreams. He now knew it had been a real whistle, not a dream one. He jumped out of bed. "Good for you, Betts," he said. "It must be Luke. He's left the circus for some reason and come back here. We'd better see what he wants. At least I'll go and see what he wants. You stay here." "I'm coming too," said Betts in an obstinate voice. I heard him, and you didn't. I'm coming too. You'll only fall down the stairs or something and make a row," said Pip. "I shan't," said Betts crossly, raising her voice. Pip nudged her. "Shut up! You'll wake everyone." "All right, come if you want to, but for goodness' sake, be quiet." They did not bother to put on dressing gowns, for the night was so warm. They padded down the passage and onto the landing. Pip fell over something and rolled down a few stairs before he was able to catch hold of the banisters and stop himself from falling any further. "What's the matter, Pip?" said Betts in alarm. "Fell over the cat," whispered back Pip. "Golly, I hope no one heard me." The two sat on the stairs, holding their breath for a minute or two, expecting to hear a movement in their parents' room, but nobody stirred. The cat sat at the bottom of the stairs, her green eyes gleaming in the darkness. I believe she tripped me up on purpose," said Pip. "She's been awfully cross ever since we let Buster into the house. Get away, puss!" The cat mewed and fled. The children went groping their way down the dark passage to the garden door. Pip unlocked it, and they stepped out into the silent garden. Betts clung to Pip's hand. She didn't very much like the dark. The whistle sounded again. It's somewhere at the top of the garden," said Pip. "Come on, 
Keep on the grass, Bets. The gravel makes a noise. The two crept over the lawn, up the kitchen garden, and round past the big rubbish heap. A shadow moved by the old summer house. It was Luke. They heard his voice in the darkness. So Luke had come back after all. Chapter Thirteen. Luke finds some good friends. Luke, is that you? Whispered Pip. What's the matter? Why did you leave the circus? Pip drew Luke into the summer house. Bet sat on one side of him and Pip on the other. Yes, I left the circus camp, he said. That policeman went to my uncle Jake and he told him all about the stolen cat and that he thought I'd taken it. And he said, "Did my uncle know anything about the cat?" And I suppose your uncle sent you off when he heard all that," said Pip. "He didn't give me away to the policeman," said Luke. "He said he hadn't heard of no stolen cat, and he hadn't seen me for weeks and didn't want to. I reckon a search will be made of the circus, though, because that Bobby is quite certain Dark Queen is somewhere there. I suppose they'd make a search for you too," said Bets. "Yes," said Luke. "Well." My uncle waited till the bobby was safely out of sight. Then he came to me and told me to go. Said he didn't mind me running away from my stepfather, but he wasn't going to help me run away from the police. Will you go back to your stepfather? Asked Pip. He isn't very kind to you. Thing is, said Luke, what am I going to do? I came here tonight because I thought you might be able to give me something to eat. I've had nothing since twelve o'clock and I'm starving. Oh, poor Luke, said Bats. I'll go and get you something at once. There's a steak pie in the kitchen and a plum tart. I saw them both. Here, Bets, don't be silly," said Pip, pulling her back. "What do you suppose Mother will say in the morning if she finds both a pie and a tart gone? You can't tell a lie and say you don't know anything about it. Then, if you have to own up, people will ask you whom you gave the stuff to, and they'll guess it's Luke. Well, what shall we give him then?" asked Bets. "Bread and butter." Said Pip, "That won't be missed, and we could take a small bun or two out of the tin. And there's lots of plums and green gages. That'll do fine," said Luke gratefully. Bet sped off at once to the kitchen. She fell over the cat, but did not hurt herself. Soon she had collected the food and was back with Luke and Pip. Luke began to munch hungrily. Oh, "I'm feeling better now," he said. "Nothing like hunger to make you feel miserable. I always say." Where are you going to sleep tonight? Asked Pip. Don't know," said Luke. "Under a hedge somewhere. Reckon I'd better sleep rough." "Don't do that," said Bets. "You stay with us for a little while. You can sleep in this old summer house. We can put the mattress from the swing seat on the bench here, and you can sleep on that. And we'll bring you food each day till we think of some plan for you," said Pip, feeling rather excited. "It will be fun. I don't want to get you into no trouble." Said Luke. Well, Luke, you won't," said Pip. "You stay in our garden, and maybe we'll be able to solve the mystery of Dark Queen, and then you can go back to your job, and everything will be all right." "I'll get the mattress off the swing seat now," said Bets, and she ran to get it in the dark. She was more used to the dark now, and she found the swing seat without difficulty. Pip went to help her. Together, the two dragged the mattress up the garden to where Luke sat in the summer house. They made a bed on the bench with the mattress, and then Pip fetched an old rug from the garage. "It's a warm night," he said to Luke. "You won't be too cold. We'll bring you some breakfast tomorrow morning." "What about your gardener?" said Luke fearfully. "What time does he come? Will he be up here at all?" "He's ill," said Pip. "He won't be back for a few days. Mother's fed up because of the vegetables. She says they want weeding, and she keeps on trying to make me and Bet do it. But I hate weeding." Oh," said Luke, relieved. "Well, I'll be pretty safe up here then. Good night, and thanks." The others slipped back to bed, excited. It was good to think of the surprise of the others next day when they heard Luke was in the garden sleeping there. Bets snuggled into bed happily. She was glad to have helped Luke. She did like him so much. It was exciting to wake the next morning and think of Luke in the summer house. Pip sat up in bed and wondered what there was for breakfast. 
If it was sausages, he could secrete one somehow and take it to Luke. If it was boiled eggs, he couldn't. Anyway, he could take bread and butter. Bet was thinking the same thing. She dressed quickly and went downstairs, wondering if she could cut some bread and butter before anyone came into the dining room. She thought she could. But just as she was cutting a big, thick slice of bread, her mother came in. She stared in surprise at Bet's. Whatever are you doing? she said. Are you so hungry that you can't wait for breakfast? And what an enormously thick slice, Bet's! Poor Bet's had to put the slice on her own plate and eat it. The porridge was brought in, and she and Pip ate theirs. Then, hurrah! A dish of sausages came in. The children's eyes gleamed. Now they would be able to take one or two to Luke. Please, can I have two sausages today? asked Pip. Me too, said Bets. Gracious, you must be hungry, Bets, said her mother. She gave them each two. Their father was hidden behind his newspaper, so he would not be able to see what they were doing. But their mother could see quite well. How could they manage to hide away a sausage each? It was going to be difficult. But just then, Annie the maid came into the room. Would you care to buy a flag for our local hospital, Mrs. Hilton? she said. Miss Lacey is at the front door. Oh, of course, said Mrs. Hilton, and got up to get her bag, which she had left upstairs. The two children winked at one another. Pip got out a clean hanky and wrapped a sausage up quickly. Bets did the same, but her hanky was not so clean. They pushed the wrapped up sausages into their pockets with slices of bread just as their mother came back. She stared at their plates in surprise. Pip! Bets! How you have gobbled your breakfasts! You shouldn't stuff like that! You had two sausages each, too, and a bowl of porridge! Bets gave a little giggle, and Pip kicked her under the table. Neither of them liked to try and smuggle any more food into their pockets that meal, for they couldn't help feeling that their mother was watching them, puzzled and surprised. Luke was glad of the bread and sausages. They took him some water to drink, too. He sat in the summer house eating, and they talked in low voices. We'll bring you something at dinner time, too. Said Pip, and you can pick yourself plums and green gauges from the trees, can't you, Luke? Luke nodded. He drank the water and handed back the cup. Then there came the sound of someone calling, Cooey! And Bets jumped up. It's Fatty and Buster! Hey, Fatty, here we are in the summer house! Fatty came up the garden with Buster. The little Scotty darted into the summer house, barking with delight to see his friend there. Luke patted him. Fatty stopped at the entrance to the summer house, his mouth falling open in the greatest amazement when he saw Luke there. Bets laughed at his surprise. We're going to hide him here, she explained to Fatty. And we're going to bring him food. It's exciting. Oh, Fatty, can't we solve the mystery so that Luke isn't afraid any more? Do let's hurry up and solve the mystery. Fatty had to hear all about the night's happenings. Then Daisy and Larry came and added their surprise and delight to the little company. Altogether, it was a very pleasant morning. Where's that whistle we found in the cat's cage? said Pip. It was produced and held up for Luke to see. We found it in the cage, said Fatty. And as we thought Mr. Goon would be sure to find it, and Mr. Tapping would tell him it was yours, we took it out and kept it. And we put a lot of false clues in the cage. <laughs> You'd have laughed to see them. I put a matchstick in the cage and one under it. Luke whistled. Ho ho! He said. So that's why Mr. Goon got all excited when he found my uncle smoking a cigar. I couldn't think why he did. My uncle said he went quite purple in the face when he took out a cigar and lit it with a match. The children giggled to think that Fatty's matchsticks had made Mr. Goon get all excited when he saw Jake using a match to light a cigar. Then Luke looked at the whistle that Fatty held. Yes, that's one I made, he said. I lost it somewhere in the garden. How could it have got into the cat's cage? I made that whistle months ago. They all talked over the mystery again, but somehow they could not make head or tail of it. Luke insisted that no one had come near the cage whilst he had been at work there. And that being so, how was it that Dark Queen had disappeared then?
All the children saved bits of their dinner for Luke. Daisy nearly got into trouble for putting a jam tart into her pocket. Her mother saw her and was very cross. Daisy, what are you doing with that tart? Surely you are not putting it into your pocket. Oh, how silly of me! Said Daisy, taking it out again and looking at the tart as if she had thought it was her handkerchief. If you are trying to take food away for that dog of Frederick's, I must certainly forbid it," said her mother. "The dog is too fat already." "Oh, mother, I certainly won't give food away to Buster," said Daisy earnestly. "I wouldn't dream of it." Between them, the children managed to supply Luke with plenty of food. They gave him a pail of water and soap and an old towel. They made up a bed for him each night in the summer house, and in return, Luke worked in the vegetable garden whenever Pip's mother was out, weeding it carefully and doing all he could to make it nice. The kitchen garden was far away from the house, and he could not be seen. Must do something in return for your kindness," he said to the children, and they liked him all the better for it. For three days. Luke stayed in Pip's garden, and then things began to happen again. Chapter Fourteen. Mister Goon is very suspicious. Missus Hilton, Pip's mother, walked up the garden one day and was filled with astonishment to see the vegetables looking so neat and so well weeded. She stood and gazed at them in amazement. And then she called Pip and Bets. She smiled lovingly at them. Pip, Bets, what good, kind children you are! You have been weeding the vegetable garden for me whilst the gardener is ill, and you haven't told me a word about it. I am very, very pleased with you. Bets opened her mouth to say at once that she and Pip had had nothing to do with it, but Pip gave her such an alarming frown that she shut it again. She went very red. Pip was red too. Neither of them liked being praised for something they hadn't done. But how could they say they hadn't done it without giving Luke away? It's almost as bad as being praised for something we oughtn't to get praised for as being blamed for something we haven't done. Thought Pip. Oh golly, I suppose Bets and I had better set to work and do a little weeding. Then we can safely admit to having worked in the garden, even though old Luke has done most of it. So. Much to the others' surprise, Pip and Bets actually did some weeding and felt very virtuous indeed. Luke laughed to see them. <laughs> Little Bets has pulled up half the lettuce seedlings, he said. She thought they were weeds. Never mind, Bets. There are plenty more lettuces. One afternoon, Mister Goon met Fatty and Buster, and he stopped them. I want a word with you, Master Frederick, he said in his pompous voice. He took out his big black notebook. He flicked over the pages. "I'm afraid I can't stop," said Fatty in a polite voice. "I'm taking Buster for a walk." "You just stop where you are," said Clearwolf angrily. "I tell you, I've got something to say to you." "Ah, here we are," said Mister Goon, apparently finding the page he wanted in his notebook. "Here we are. On the fifth of this month, Master Frederick." You and the other four children were wandering around the circus cap, and you spoke to a man called Jake. Right, first time," said Fatty, wondering what was coming. "You be civil, young man," said Mister Goon angrily. Fatty looked very innocently at him, and Mister Goon felt himself getting cross. Fatty could be intensely annoying in a most polite way. "Well, tell me what you want," said Fatty. I really must go. Buster is getting most impatient," <laughs> said Buster, playing up well. "Now then," said Mister Goon, putting his face near to Fatty's, who drew back at once. "Now then, what I want to know is this: that Luke was in the camp, wasn't he?" "Was he?" said Fatty. "Well,、uh, why ask me if you know where he was? <laughs> go and find him there." "Ah," said Mister Goon. That's the point. He's not there now. One of them circus children let the cat out of the bag, and let the cat out of the bag," said Fatty, purposely misunderstanding. "What, Dark Queen? Do you mean? Have they put her into a bag? 
Did you see her? Where is she now? Why did they put her into a bag? What? Hold your tongue," said Mister Goon. "I said, let the cat out of the bag. Not meaning anything about Dark Queen, as you very well know. I meant that a young circus girl told me she had seen Luke there, but when I searched the camp, he'd gone." Bad luck," said Fatty sympathetically. Mister Goon glared at him. "Well, what's the matter with saying bad luck, Mister Goon?" said Fatty in an aggrieved voice. "You told me to be civil." "Now look here," said Mister Goon, coming to the point at last. "I think you and them other children knows where Luke is. See, and I'm just warning you. If you hide him or know where he's hiding and don't inform the police." You'll get into serious trouble, very serious trouble. Fatty was startled. Why did Mister Goon suspect that they knew where Luke was or were hiding him? What makes you think we'd try to hide Luke? He said, as if we could hide him without you knowing, Mister Goon. Why, a clever policeman like you knows everything. Ah," said Mister Goon. "I know a lot more than you think." That apparently was the end of the talk. Mister Goon shut his notebook with a snap and went on his way. Fatty went down the lane, thinking hard. Old Tapping must have popped his head over the wall and either spotted Luke or thought he did. Thought Fatty. Blow! We don't want to get into trouble. But what are we going to do with poor old Luke? Perhaps we had better give him some money and get him away. The others listened to what Fatty told them. Bets was upset. "Don't send Luke away," she said. "We might solve the mystery any time, and then he could go back to Lady Candling's." "We shan't solve this mystery," said Fatty gloomily. "We aren't so clever as we thought we were. I bet even Inspector Jenks wouldn't be able to solve the mystery of Dark Queen." "Oh," said Daisy at once. Remembering how nice and friendly the inspector had been in the Easter holidays when they had solved another mystery, Inspector Jenks, I'd forgotten about him. Can't we get into touch with him and tell him about poor old Luke? I'm sure he wouldn't want to put him into prison or anything. He'd keep our secret, all right. Do you think he would? Said Larry. Well, I'm blessed if I can see any way out of this. If old Clearoff starts searching Pip's garden, he'll find Luke. And then maybe it will be worse for him and bad for us. Let's tell the inspector. He always said he would help us and be a friend to us if he could. I like him," said Betts. "Oh, you like nearly everyone," said Pip. "Not Mister Tubbing or Clearoff," said Betts. "Oh, do let's tell the inspector everything. I'm sure he'll understand." "I'll telephone," said Fatty. The others looked at him respectfully. They thought it was rather marvellous of Fatty to offer to telephone to what Betts called a very, very high-up policeman. Fatty kept his word. He went back home, waited until no one was about to hear him, and then put a call through to the police station in the nearest big town where the inspector lived. Very luckily for him, Inspector Jenks happened to be there. He came to the telephone and spoke pleasantly to Fatty. Ah, Master Frederick Trotville. I hope you are well. Yes, yes, I well remember the most interesting time we had together in the Easter holidays, when you so kindly solved the mystery of the burnt cottage. Very clever piece of work, if I may say so. And have you solved any other mysteries since? Well, sir, there is a mystery here we can't solve," said Fatty, relieved to find the inspector so very friendly. "We simply can't. I don't know if you've heard of it. A very valuable cat disappeared." The inspector appeared to think hard for a minute, then his voice came again over the phone. Yes, the report came in to me. I remember it. I believe our friend Mister Goon is in charge of that particular puzzle. Well, he isn't exactly a friend of ours," said Fatty honestly. But the person who is supposed to have done the crime is a friend of ours, and that's what I'm really ringing you up about. We're in a bit of a muddle about him. I was just wondering if, by any chance, you could give us a little advice. Very nice of you to ask me," said the inspector. "It so happens I am coming through your village tomorrow. I suppose you couldn't invite me to tea, say a picnic tea by the river."
Oh, yes, said Fatty joyfully. That would be simply fine. We could tell you everything then. Then that's settled, said the inspector. I'll be along your lane about four o'clock. It will be most pleasant for us all to meet again. I hope you agree with me. Oh, I do, said Fatty. Goodbye, sir, and thank you very much. Fatty put down the receiver and sped down the lane to Pip's house, full of excitement. He ran up the drive and found the others in the garden. Well, said Fatty, that's all settled. The inspector is coming to tea with us tomorrow, a picnic tea down by the river. We'll tell him everything. Fatty, is he really coming? Did you ask him to tea? Oh, Fatty, how marvellous! cried the others. Fatty swelled up, full of pride and importance. You want a fellow like me to arrange these things, he said. It's nothing to me to get things like this done. You'd better leave everything to me. Shut up, said Larry and Pip at once. But they could not be annoyed with Fatty's boasting for long, because they were all so excited at the thought of seeing the big, kindly inspector once more. Betts was really thrilled. She had liked him so much, and he had put everything right at once last time. Perhaps he could this time. We'll plan a fine tea, said Daisy. We'll tell our mothers who is coming with us, and they are sure to let us have anything we want. Even grown ups seem to think that inspectors are somebody to make a fuss about. Daisy was right. As soon as the children's mothers knew that the great inspector Jenks was going to have a picnic tea with the children, they provided a very fine meal. Chocolate buns, said Daisy joyfully, and cucumber sandwiches. Ginger biscuits and a big currant cake, said Pip. What a pity old Luke can't come too. Well, we'll save some for him. Tomato and paste sandwiches and a jam sponge, said Fatty. Golly, aren't we lucky? The children packed up the food and went to stand at the front gate to watch for the inspector. Mr. Goon came riding down on his bicycle. He jumped off when he saw them. I'd like a word with you. He said in his pompous voice. Sorry, said Larry, but we're on our way to a picnic. I bet you'd like to come. It's going to be a gorgeous one. We've got chocolate buns and currant cake and a jam sponge and. began Betts. Mr. Goon looked in astonishment at all the food. You going to eat all that yourselves? he said suspiciously. Fatty guessed that he thought they were going to take some to Luke. He grinned. Oh, no. Said Fatty, "The food is for somebody else besides ourselves, Mister Goon. We shan't tell you who. That will be giving away a secret." Hmm," said Mister Goon, feeling more and more suspicious. "Where are you going for your picnic?" "Down by the river," said Betts. Mister Goon got on his bicycle and rode away, thinking hard. Fatty chuckled. "He thinks we're taking this food to Luke in some hiding place somewhere," he said. He doesn't know we're having a picnic with the inspector. I say, wouldn't it be perfectly marvellous if he tried to follow us and pounced on us to see if we really had got Luke with us, and all the time it was Inspector Jenks? Yes, marvellous," said Daisy. "Oh, look, here's the inspector." It was. He drove up in a very smart black police car, parked it in Pip's garage, and then shook hands solemnly all round. Very, very pleased to meet you all again," he said with his beaming smile. "Let me see. What did you call yourselves? The Five Find Outers and Dog. Ah,、oh, yes, and here's the dog, <laughs> a very, very nice little fellow, if I may say so. They all went down the lane to the river. Betts hanging onto his arm. The inspector was a tall, burly man with twinkling eyes, a smiling mouth, and a very clever face. He looked very fine indeed in his uniform. Betts chattered to him, telling him all the good things they had got for tea. "We'll have our meal straight away, shall we?" said the inspector. "You are making my mouth water. Now, where shall we sit?" Chapter Fifteen. Mister Goon has a bad time. They found a nice sheltered place close to the water. Behind them rose an overhanging bank with trees. No one could see them there. It was a good place to talk. They said nothing about their difficulties at first. 
They all ate hungrily, and the inspector enjoyed his tea just as much as anyone else. Buster adored him, lay on his knee and licked up every crumb that fell from his fingers. It was a very happy party. Well now, said the inspector, when the meal was finished and there was very little left. Well now, what about a little business? I've looked up the report of the case you told me about, so I know all the details. But I should very much like to hear what you have to say. You tell me that this boy, Luke, is a friend of yours. The children began to talk eagerly, telling Inspector Jenks all that they knew, but they did not tell him about the false clues they had laid for Mr. Tapping and Clearoff. Nobody quite liked to tell him that. Then they came to where they had talked to Luke at the circus and how he had come to them one night. And ever since then, we fed Luke and let him sleep in the summer house, said Pitt. But now we think Clearoff, Mr. Goon, I mean, has guessed we're hiding him, and we're afraid if we go on doing it, we may get him and ourselves into trouble. Very wise of you to come to me, said the inspector. Yes, you mustn't hide Luke, that is certain. For one thing, it tells against Luke if he runs away and hides. That is never a good thing to do. But he won't be put into prison, don't be afraid of that. For one thing, he is only fifteen, and for another thing, we don't put people into prison unless it is really proved that they have committed a crime, and it is by no means proved that Luke stole the cat, although I admit that things do look very black against him. I am sure you agree with me. Yes, we think they do too, said Fatty. It has puzzled us very much, because you see, Inspector, we know and like Luke, and we don't see how a boy like him could have done such a thing. He's a bit quiet and always wary of grown ups, and he's very kind. But Mr. Goon and Mr. Tapping are both quite sure he did it. Well, I would advise Luke to come out of hiding and go back to his job, said the inspector. Uh, I don't see that he need say anything about where he has been or who has hidden him. No need for that at all. He'll have to go back to his stepfather, said Betts. And oh, Inspector Jenks, he's got such an unkind stepfather. He'll scold him severely. No, he won't, said the inspector. I shall have a word with him. I think you'll find that he'll let Luke severely alone. In the meantime, I will look more carefully into this mystery and see if I can get a little light shed on it. It certainly sounds most interesting now that I have heard all you have told me. You are a nice inspector. Said Betts, putting her hand into his. I hope, if ever I do anything very wrong, that it will be you who catches me and no one else. Everyone laughed. I don't expect you will ever do anything wrong, Betts, said the inspector, smiling down into Betts's earnest little face. I shall be most astonished if you do. What's up with Buster? said Fatty at that moment. Buster had left the little company and could be heard barking madly at the top of the bank. Then a voice came to their ears. Call this dog off! Get him under control or I'll report him! It's all clear off, whispered Daisy gleefully. He's tracked us after all. I bet he thinks we've got Luke down here. Old Buster must have heard him creeping up and gone and barked at him. Hey, you! Will you call this dog off of me? Came Mr. Goon's angry voice. Fatty went up the bank and through the overhanging bushes and stood on the top, looking at a very angry Mr. Goon. Ha!、Huh. I knew you were down there, said Mr. Goon. Yes, and I know who you've got with you, too. Then I wonder why you're not a bit more polite about it, said Fatty in a smooth voice. Polite about it? Why should I be? said Mr. Goon. Ah! I've caught you properly, I have, harbouring someone who's done a crime. You've gone too far this time, you have. You call this dog off and let me go down the bank and get my hands on you know who. Fatty gave a chuckle. He called the buster off and held him by the collar, standing politely aside whilst Mr. Goon pushed his way through the bushes and then jumped down beside the water, expecting to find four frightened children and a very scared Luke. Instead, to his awful horror and amazement, he found his inspector. Mr. Goon simply could not believe his eyes. They always bulged out, but now they looked as if they were going to drop out. 
He stood and stared at Inspector Jenks and could not utter a word. Good afternoon, Goon," said the inspector. <laughs> Began Goon and then swallowed hastily. Good afternoon, sir. I did. I didn't expect to see you here. I thought I heard you say you wanted to get your hands on me," said the inspector. Goon swallowed hard again, loosened his collar with his finger, and then tried to smile. "You will have your joke, sir," he said in a rather trembling voice. "I, uh, I, I, I expected to find somebody else. It's um, it's a great surprise to see you here, sir. Well." These children have paid me the honour of consulting me about this little affair of the stolen cat," said the inspector. "Sit down, Goon. It would be good to hear your version of the business. I suppose you haven't got very far with the case." "Well, sir, I've got a lot of clues, sir," said Mr. Goon eagerly, hoping to alter the inspector's opinion of him. "I'd like your advice on them, sir. Now you're here, sir." He took a white envelope from his pocket and opened it. Out came the two matchsticks, the blue button, the half hair ribbon, the peppermint drop, and the brown shoelace. The inspector stared at them in considerable astonishment. "Are all these clues?" he asked at last. "Yes, sir," said Goon. "Found in the place where the crime was committed, sir, in the cat house itself." Did you really find all these things in the cat house? Said the inspector, looking at everything as if he really could not believe they were there. Was this peppermint drop there, Goon? Yes, sir. Everything. Never found so many clues in my life before, sir. Said Goon, pleased to see the inspector's surprise. Neither have I. Said the inspector. He glanced round at the five children. They were horrified at seeing Goon show the false clues to Inspector Jenks. A very small twinkle came into the inspector's eyes. "Well, Goon," said the inspector, "you are much to be congratulated on discovering so many clues. Ah,、uh, I suppose you children haven't discovered any too." Fatty pulled out the envelope in which he had put duplicates of the same things that Goon had found. He undid the envelope solemnly and slowly. Bets wanted to giggle, but she didn't dare to. I don't know if you'd call these clues, sir," said Fatty. "Probably not. We don't think they are, sir, either." To Goon's open-mouthed astonishment, Fatty proceeded to take from the envelope complete duplicates of the clues that Goon had taken out of his own envelope. First came the peppermint drop. One peppermint drop," said Fatty solemnly. Then came the hair ribbon. Half of somebody's hair ribbon," said Fatty. Daisy gave a squeal of laughter. One brown shoelace," said Fatty, and pulled that out too. Then came the blue button. One blue button, and、uh, two matchsticks. Two," said Goon faintly. "What's all this?" There's something funny about all this. It is certainly peculiar, to say the least of it," said the inspector. "I am sure you children all agree with me." The children said nothing. They really did not know what to say. Even Fatty said nothing, though in his heart he applauded Inspector Jenks very loudly for guessing everything and giving away nothing. Well," said Inspector Jenks. Suppose you replace all these various clues in their envelopes. I hardly feel they are going to help us a great deal, but perhaps you think otherwise, Goon. No, sir," said poor Goon, his face purple with rage, astonishment, and shock. To think that his wonderful clues were the same as the children's. Whatever did it mean? Poor Goon. The meaning did eventually dawn on him, but not until he was in bed that night. Then he could do nothing about it, for he knew he would never dare to reopen the matter of his clues again with Inspector Jenks on the children's side. And now, Goon," said the inspector in a business-like tone, "I propose that we go to this boy Luke and tell him to come out of his hiding place and face up to things. We can't have him hiding away for weeks." Mister Goon's mouth fell open for the third or fourth time that afternoon. 
Find Luke. Go to his hiding place. What in the world did the inspector know about all that? He gave the children a glare. Interfering busybodies. Just as you say, sir, he said to the inspector, and rose ponderously from the ground. Come along, said Inspector Jenks to the children. We'll go and have a word, a kind word, with poor old hunted Luke. Chapter Sixteen, A Great Surprise. The inspector led the way over the field and up the lane, with Betts hanging onto his arm. Goon came last of all, with Buster hopefully sniffing round his heels. Poor Goon did not even like to say "clear off" to Buster; he was so subdued. Somehow the children had not thought that the inspector would have insisted on Luke's coming out from his hiding place and going back to his job. They wondered what Luke himself would have to say about it. They all went up the lane. Fatty tried to hold a cheerful conversation with Mister Goon, but the policeman only scowled at him behind Inspector Jenks's broad back. The river's a very nice place for a picnic, don't you think so, Mister Goon? Asked Fatty cheerfully. I wonder you don't go there sometimes on your days off, or don't you ever have a day off? Mister Goon made some sort of answering noise, giving Fatty a look that should have burned him up, but didn't. It's funny we found the same clues as you did, isn't it, Mister Goon? Said Fatty, still in the same innocent voice. Daisy exploded into a laugh. Mister Goon made another noise, and his eyes bulged out a little more. He'll have a heart attack or a fit or something if you say any more, Fatty," said Larry in a low voice. Fatty grinned. He said no more, but watched Buster with great approval. The little Scotty was getting under poor Mister Goon's feet in a most annoying manner. "In here," said Pip when they reached his gate. They all went up the drive and into the garden. Then Pip stopped and looked at the inspector. "Should I just go up and explain to Luke that you say he's to come out and go back to his job?" he said. "You can't think how scared he is." "I think that's a good idea," said Inspector Jenks. "But I think the one to see him and talk to him should be me. Now, don't you worry. I know how to treat boys like Luke." Mister Goon scowled again. He knew best how to handle young scoundrels like Luke. The inspector was too soft for words, always giving people a chance, never believing things till they were proved. Why, it stuck out a mile that Luke had stolen that cat. But Goon could not say what he thought, so he sat down on a nearby seat and began to write in his notebook, taking no notice of the children at all. Inspector Jenks went with Pip up the garden to the summer house. But Luke was not there. Oh, there he is! Look," said Pip, pointing to where Luke was busy hoeing the kitchen garden. He says he can't just sit and do nothing, Inspector, and he thinks if he does a bit of weeding for us, it is a small way of returning a kindness. A nice thought, if I may say so," murmured the Inspector, watching Luke at his work, taking in the boy from head to foot. He turned to Pip. Just give him a call. Tell him I'm a friend, and then leave us, please," he said. "Hey, Luke!" yelled Pip. "I've brought a good friend of ours to see you. Come and talk to him." Luke turned and saw the big inspector in his blue uniform. He went white and seemed as if he was rooted to the ground. "I didn't steal no cat," he said at last, staring at the inspector. "Well, suppose you tell me all about it," said Inspector Jenks. We'll go and sit in the summer house. He took Luke firmly by the arm and led him to the summer house, where the children had so often talked over the mystery of Dark Queen's disappearance. Luke was trembling. Pip gave him a comforting grin and then ran back down the garden to the others. Mister Goon looked up from his notebook. "Huh," he said. "So that's where you hid him, up at the top of your garden, is it?" And why didn't you tell me that instead of the inspector? Always trying to put me in the wrong, you are. Oh, Mister Goon, we couldn't do that, could we? Said Fatty. I shouldn't ever have thought you could have been put into the wrong. Not a clever policeman like you. I've had enough of you this afternoon. I have," said Mister Goon in a threatening voice. Always cheeking me. A downright bad boy you are. 
I know what I'd do with you if I were your father. Have a peppermint drop, Mr. Goon," said Fatty, holding out the peppermint drop from his white envelope. We shan't want these clues any more, I suppose, so we might as well eat the peppermints. Mr. Goon made a disgusted noise and said no more. It simply wasn't any use at all talking to Fatty. He could always go one better than anyone else. Larry thought he must be very trying indeed to his teachers at school. The children all wondered how Luke was getting on with the inspector. They seemed to be a very long time together, but at last footsteps were heard coming down the gravel path. Mister Goon shut his notebook and stood up. All the children looked to see if Luke was with the inspector. He was, and he looked quite cheerful too. The inspector was smiling his usual twinkling smile. Bets ran to him. Is Luke going to come out of hiding? What is he going to do? Well, I am pleased to say that Luke agrees with me that it would be better to go back to his job than to hide here any longer," said the inspector. "But what about his unkind stepfather?" said Daisy, who couldn't bear the thought of Luke being ill-treated any more. "Ah," said the inspector, "I must arrange about that. I had meant to have a word with him myself, but the time is getting on." He looked at his watch. "Hmm. Yes, I must be getting back." Goon, you must go down to Luke's stepfather at once and inform him that the boy is not to be ill-treated. You must also go to Mister Tupping, who I understand is the gardener next door, and inform him that Luke is to be taken back with Lady Candling's permission and is to be given a chance in the garden again. Mister Goon looked very taken aback. After encouraging both the boy's stepfather and Mister Tupping to treat the boy sternly and hardly, it was scarcely a pleasant job for him to do. Fatty looked sharply at the inspector. I bet he's making Mister Goon do that to punish him for frightening a young boy," thought Fatty. Inspector Jenks fastened his eyes on Mister Goon. "You have understood my orders, Goon," he said in a voice that sounded quite pleasant and yet had a very hard note in it. Mister Goon nodded hastily. "Yes, sir. Perfectly, sir," he said. I'll go to the boy's stepfather now, sir. Name of Brown, and I'll make it my business to see Mister Tupping too, sir. Naturally, if any complaints are made to me of ill treatment, I shall hold you responsible, Goon," said Inspector Jenks. But I imagine you will impress it carefully on these two men that the orders are mine, and that one of your duties is to see that my orders are carefully carried out. I am sure you agree with me in this, Goon. Oh yes, sir. Of course, sir. Said Mister Goon, and、uh, about the stolen cat, sir. About the case, I mean. Are we to drop the case, sir? Not make any more inquiries, I mean. Well, you might study those clues of yours and see if they shed any light on the case," said the inspector gravely, with a wicked twinkle in his eye. Mister Goon did not answer. The inspector turned to the children and gravely shook hands with them all. It's been splendid to see the five find outers and dog again," he said. "Goodbye, and thanks for a wonderful tea—the nicest I've had for weeks, if I may say so." The inspector got out his shiny black car. He roared down the drive, waving to the children. He was gone. "I'm going to see Mister Tupping," said Mister Goon, with a scowl at the children and Luke. But don't you think this case is all closed and forgotten? It isn't. I'm still working on it, even if the inspector don't pay much attention to it. And I'll get the thief all right in the end. You see if I don't. He gave Luke such a nasty look that the boy knew quite well he was still suspected. He watched Mister Goon go down the drive on his way to see Tupping. The children crowded round him. Luke, did you like our inspector? Luke, what did he say to you? Tell us everything. He was mighty nice," said Luke. "Not a bit like that, Mister Goon, all frets and shouts. But how did I ever come to promise I would go back to my job and go back to live with my stepfather too? I wish I hadn't promised that. I'm frit. This was a new word to the children. Bet stared at Luke. "What's frit?" she asked. "Well, I'm frit," repeated Luke. Real frit, frit of Mister Tuppin and Mister Goon and my stepfather too. 
He means he's frightened," said Fatty. "What a lovely word, frit! <laughs> I shall always say that now, frit. I'm often frit," said Bets. "I was frit the other night when I had a bad dream. I was frit today when old Clearoff stopped to speak to us. And poor Luke is frit too," said Daisy, looking at the big boy with his untidy hair hanging over his brown forehead. "What are we to do about it? How can we stop him being frit?" If only we can find that cat," said Pip. "Then Luke wouldn't need to be frit of anyone. He's only frit because he thinks they all suspect him of stealing it. I'd be frit too if I thought something like that." There came a sound from the bushes nearby. Buster pricked up his ears, gave a loud bark, and flung himself into the bushes. There was a terrific scrimmage, and then something leapt wildly up a tree. The children went to see what the matter was. They all had a tremendous surprise. Staring down at them from the tree was a beautiful Siamese cat. There was no mistaking its brilliant blue eyes and chocolate and cream colouring. But it was Luke who gave them the biggest surprise of all. "It's Dark Queen!" he shouted. "Can't you see the ring of creamy hairs in her tail? I tell you, it's Dark Queen come back! Oh, what a strange thing!" All the children at once saw the ring of light hairs in Dark Queen's swinging tail. The lovely Siamese swung it to and fro in anger as she watched Buster jumping up and down below. "Take Buster away, Fatty," said Larry in excitement. "Shut him up in a shed or something. He'll scare Dark Queen and she'll run away. And poor old Luke will probably get the blame again if old Mister Goon has anything to do with it." Buster was shut up in a shed, much to his indignation. He nearly tore the door down in his eagerness to escape. Dark Queen quietened down when Fatty led the dog away. She sat up there in the tree, purring. "She's thin," said Daisy. "And look how muddy she is," said Larry. "Her coat is dirty and tangled. Let's take her to Miss Harmer. What a surprise she will have!" Chapter Seventeen. Luke has a better time. Dark Queen allowed Daisy to lift her gently down from the tree. Then the five of them made their way with Luke down the drive and into the garden next door. They went to the cat house, and on the way they met Lady Candling. She cried out in surprise when she saw a cat in Daisy's arms. "You mustn't take my cats out of their house. Did Miss Harmer let you? It's Dark Queen." Said Larry, "She suddenly appeared in Pip's garden just now, Lady Candling. Isn't it marvellous? Won't Miss Harmer be pleased?" "Good gracious!" said Lady Candling, most astonished. She glanced at Dark Queen's tail and saw the little ring of light hairs that grew there. "Yes, it's my beautiful Dark Queen. Where ever has she been? She looks thin and half starved. Isn't it a pity she can't talk? Then she could tell us." Said Bets, stroking the purring cat. Lady Candling, here's Luke too. We've been hiding him because we were sorry for him. You'll take him back, won't you? Of course," said Lady Candling. Inspector Jenks has just been telephoning to me. Well, Luke, you can certainly come back freely now, can't you? For here is Dark Queen returned in safety. We're just taking her to Miss Harmer," said Larry. "Won't she be pleased?" I'll come with you," said Lady Candling. "Oh, there is Miss Trimble. Miss Trimble, what do you think has happened? Dark Queen has come back." "Good gracious me!" said Miss Trimble, trotting up in excitement, her glasses falling off at once. "Where did she come from? Who brought her?" The children told her, and Miss Trimble listened in surprise, putting on her glasses again. Bets began to count how many times they fell off. They all went to the cat house. Miss Harmer was there, petting one or two of the cats, for she was very fond of them. When she saw Dark Queen in Daisy's arms, she was so astonished that she couldn't say a word. She held out her arms, and Dark Queen, with one graceful bound, was into them. The cat snuggled up to Miss Harmer, butting her with its head and purring deeply and loudly. "Well," said Miss Harmer in delight. Where did you come from, Dark Queen? 
Oh, how glad I am to have you back! Everyone told her at once how Dark Queen had suddenly appeared. Miss Harmer took a good look at the cat. She's thin, she said, and her coat is rough and full of those little burrs you find stuck to your legs when you go out in the fields now. I think she must have escaped from whoever had her and made her way home for miles, probably through the fields and woods. Cats are very clever in that way, aren't they? Said Fatty. Poor old Dark Queen, I guess you are glad to be back again. At that moment, Mister Tupping came into sight with Mister Goon. The policeman had evidently been telling him about the inspector and his orders, and Tupping's voice was very sour. He gave Luke a scowl and then saw Dark Queen. It's Dark Queen," said Betts. "She's come back. Aren't you glad, Mister Tupping? Now she's not stolen any more." Mr. Tupping seemed as if he could not believe his eyes. He kept looking at Dark Queen in amazement, and he twisted her tail round to make sure she had the little ring of creamy hairs there. As for Goon, his mouth fell open and his eyes bulged more than ever. His notebook came out, and the policeman began to write slowly in it. Have to make a report of this here reappearance to the inspector, he said importantly. I'd like some details. Were you here, Lady Candling, when the cat returned? Once more, the children retold the story of Dark Queen's reappearance, and Goon wrote busily in his black notebook. Mister Tapping was the only person who showed no signs at all of being pleased about the cat coming back. He glared at the cat as if it had thoroughly displeased him. Oh, Tapping, before you go, I want to say that Inspector Jenks and I have had a talk about Luke. Said Lady Candling in her low, clear voice, and he is to start work here again tomorrow. Those are my wishes, as no doubt Mister Goon too has told you. I hope that I shall have no fault to find with your treatment of Luke. Well, your ladyship, if you and the inspector want to have a boy like that in your employ, began Tapping in an uncivil tone. Lady Candling cut him short. I don't want to discuss the matter with you, Tapping. I have told you my wishes. That should be enough. Lady Candling walked off, and Miss Trimble followed her. Her glasses falling off with the thrill of hearing Tupping ticked off. I wish I could speak to people like that," said Fatty, with a side glance at Mister Tupping. "People who deserved it, I mean, of course." Now you clear off," said Mister Goon, seeing that Tupping was rapidly going purple in the face. "I want to look for more clues." Said Fatty wickedly, "You know, there might be a pear drop left about, or a toffee, or something.、Uh, by the way, Mister Goon, have you eaten your peppermint drop yet?" Now it was Mister Goon's turn to go purple in the face. The children squealed with laughter and ran for the wall. They didn't know how Fatty thought of such things to say, or how he dared to say them. They clambered over the wall and dropped down to the other side. Fatty went to let a very angry Buster out of the shed. Then Betsy's mother called her for her bedtime. The little girl gave a groan. Oh, blow! I always have to leave just when I don't want to. Haven't we had an exciting time today? I should jolly well think so," said Pip. Tea with the inspector. Luke made to come out of his hiding place. Dark Queen coming back. Goodness, there's no mystery left to solve now, is there? Well, we still don't know who did steal Dark Queen," said Larry. "I wonder if she could have escaped by herself somehow, and Luke didn't notice that she slipped off. Maybe the cage door wasn't locked and she pushed it open, or something like that." "I don't think that's at all possible," said Fatty. "But we may as well think that. Anyway, we've been a failure at solving the mystery, so we'll pretend there wasn't one." Dark Queen just escaped by herself, and then came back when she was tired of being loose. But nobody really believed that, of course. They were all very disappointed that they, the five find outers, hadn't been able to solve the next door mystery. Luke went back to his stepfather that night. He was not punished, nor was he grumbled at. Evidently, Mister Goon had made it quite clear that Luke was not to be ill-treated in any way. The stepfather said nothing to the boy at all. His meal was placed before him, and he ate it, washing up the dishes afterwards. Luke went back to his work the next morning. 
He still felt very wary of Mr. Tapping, that that gentleman did not go for him as he usually did. Plainly, what the inspector said had to be taken notice of. Lady Candling's orders could not lightly be disobeyed either. Tapping had a very good job, and he knew it. He did not want to lose it in a hurry. Luke was very glad that Dark Queen had come back. Now he felt somehow that things were all right again. He worked very hard, and the children heard his cheerful whistle every now and again as he wheeled his barrow up and down the garden. They climbed over the wall to see him as he worked. He was forking over a bed. Hello, Luke," said Bets. "Is it nice to be back at work?" Luke nodded. "It is that," he said. "I'm not one for lazing around. Well, I never thanked you children properly for hiding me and feeding me like you did, but you know I'm grateful, though I can't talk easily like you do." "That's all right, Luke," said Larry. "We were glad to help you." "I'll make you all whistles if you like," said Luke. "Fine ones." Not tiddly little ones like I made for Bets. Proper big ones, and I'll paint them up for you. See? Oh, thanks very much," said Pip, pleased. "I think your whistles are lovely. You will be busy if you make us each one." Luke was busy and very happy too. It was good to carve out whistles for his five faithful friends. He wished he could make something for Buster too. He was much happier now. His stepfather did not scold him. And Mister Tapping no longer gave him abuse, though he still shouted at him. Sometimes Lady Candling gave him a kind word, and the children were always ready to talk to him or go out with him when he was off duty. Things went on very peacefully and happily. The days slipped by. The children played together in each other's gardens, and Buster hunted rabbits in both. They went for picnics. They went for bike rides. They swam in the river. It seems quite a time ago now since we thought we had another mystery to solve," said Fatty one day. "We were silly to think it was a mystery, I suppose, just a cat that disappeared and we didn't know how. There was probably quite a simple explanation of it, really. All the same, I wish we could solve a mystery these holes," said Bets. "It's not much good being a find outer if you don't find out something. I wish something else would happen. Things never do when you wish them to." Said Fatty wisely, but for once, he was wrong. Something did happen, something that made the five find outers sit up and take notice at once. Dark Queen disappeared all over again. Chapter Eighteen, the Second Disappearance. It was Luke who told the children. He came over the wall about half past five in the afternoon, looking so white and scared that the children thought he must have had a scolding from Mister Tupping or something. What's the matter? said Daisy. Dark Queen's gone again, said Luke. Yes, and gone under my very nose too, just like the last time. Whatever do you mean? said Fatty, surprised. Sit down. Tell us properly. This is extraordinary. Well. Said Luke, sitting down on the grass beside the children. Just listen to this. I was rolling the paths round and about the cat house this afternoon. You know what a lot of rain we had last night, and I always roll the paths after rain. Well, I rolled them paths up and down, up and down, and whilst I was doing that, someone stole Dark Queen, like I told you, under my very nose, and I never saw no one. How do you know she's gone? Said Larry. Well. Miss Harmer had a day off," said Luke. "She went at ten, and she came back about ten minutes ago. And as soon as she went into the cage, she gave a squeal and said, 'Dark Queen wasn't there.'" "Gracious," said everyone. "Did you look and see too, Luke?" "That I did," said Luke. "But there were only the other cats. No Dark Queen. Under my very nose she went." "How do you know she went whilst you were at work on the paths nearby?" said Fatty. She might have gone before. No, she didn't," said Luke. "You see, Lady Candling always visits the cages now, just before three o'clock, and she and Miss Harmer talk about the cats together. Well, Lady Candling saw the cats as usual at three o'clock, and Dark Queen was there. You said Miss Harmer was out for the day," said Fatty. "So she didn't see Dark Queen. No, she didn't, of course," 
said Luke. Mr. Tuppin took her ladyship to the cats today. He always does when Miss Harmer is out now, and she gives him any orders to pass on to Miss Harmer. I was there when Lady Candling and Mr. Tuppin were looking at the cats, and I heard Mr. Tuppin say, There's Dark Queen at the back, your ladyship. You can see the light hairs in her tail. So she was there then at three o'clock. And do you mean to say that since three o'clock you have been near the cages and never left them, till Miss Harmer came back just now and found Dark Queen gone? said Larry. Luke nodded. And you know what's going to be said, he muttered. I'll be accused again. I was the only one there last time, and I was the only one there this time, but I didn't touch Dark Queen. How did Miss Harmer find out that Dark Queen was gone? asked Fatty, who was taking a very close interest in all that Luke said. Well, she came back, and Mr. Tuppin met her and said he thought one of the cats wasn't very well, said Luke. So under my very eyes he went into the cage whilst Miss Harmer was coming along and got the cat he said wasn't well and then Miss Harmer joined him and almost at once squealed out that Dark Queen was gone. Could Mr. Tupping have let her loose just in that moment? asked Larry. No, said Luke. I couldn't see Mr. Tupping in the cage but I could see the door quite well and nothing came out. In fact, it was shut tight. Everyone was silent. It did seem a most extraordinary thing that Dark Queen should have gone again under Luke's very nose. How unlucky for Luke that he should have been the only one working near the cages again. Was it your own idea to roll the paths near the cat house? asked Fatty. Oh no, said Luke. I don't do things on my own. Mr. Tupping gives me his orders every day, and he told me to spend the afternoon rolling the paths there. Last time you were on the spot all the time, said Pip. And this time you were too. And last time Miss Harmer was out for the day. And this time she was too. And last time it was Mr. Tupping who went into the cage with the cats. And this time it was too. When it was found that Dark Queen had disappeared, I mean. Last time he went in with Mr. Goon. This time he went in with Miss Harmer. There are a lot of things exactly the same. It's all very, very odd. Well, I didn't take the cat last time, and I didn't take it this time either, said Luke. I know I didn't. I'd have remembered it if I had, wouldn't I? I mean, I'm not going daft, am I? I couldn't have let the cat out and not remembered it afterwards, could I? We never thought of that, said Daisy. People do do things like that sometimes, of course, and forget all about them afterwards. But I shouldn't think for a moment that you do, Luke. This is more of a mystery than ever. Said Fatty, and he got up. I'm off over the wall to snoop round a bit. Do you remember what we found in the cage last time? One of Luke's whistles. Well, as everything seems to be more or less the same this time, I bet there'll be one of Luke's whistles there again. Don't be silly, said Daisy. It's just an accident that some of the things are the same. All right, said Fatty. But look here. If I do find one of Luke's whistles in the cage, We've got to realize that that won't be an accident. That will be put there on purpose. Well, I'll go and see. Everyone wanted to come, of course, so they all clambered over the wall, Luke too. The boy was upset and frit, and he did not want to be left alone. Only Buster was left on the wrong side of the wall, tied up to a tree. He barked frantically and almost strangled himself trying to get free, but he couldn't. The five children came to the cat house. No one was there. Mr. Tapping and Miss Harmer had gone to report the matter to Lady Candling. Only the cats looked at the children, their blue eyes gleaming. Bets counted them. There were seven. Look! said Fatty, pointing into the cage. One of Luke's whistles again! It was quite true. There was one of Luke's beautifully made whistles lying on the floor. Luke stared at it in amazement. Then he went to feel in his coat, which was hanging on a tree nearby. It must have been taken from my pocket, he said. I had it in there ready to finish. It was for Pip. And someone must have taken it. And put it on the floor of the cage so that you'd be suspected again, said Fatty grimly. He stared at the whistle on the floor. Can't we get it out again, said Daisy, like we did last time? I don't expect there would be time, said Fatty. 
Look around for some other clues, quick! The children began to hunt around. Bets put her nose to the cage and sniffed hard. There's the same smell as I smelt last time, she said. What did you say it was, Fatty? Oh, yes, you said turpentine. Fatty pressed his nose to the wire and sniffed. Yes, it's turps, he said, puzzled. Golly, this is very odd. Everything seems to be repeating itself, doesn't it? The whistle on the floor, the smell of turps. I do think this is the strangest mystery I've ever come across. Fatty, I suppose this isn't a clue, is it? said Daisy, pointing to a little round blob of paint on a stone beside the path. Fatty looked at it. Shouldn't think so, he said. He picked up the stone and looked at the blob of paint. Luke paints our whistles, he said. Probably this is a drop of paint he spilt. Have you ever painted our whistles here, Luke? No, never, said Luke at once. I always do them in the shed where the pots of paint are kept. Anyway, I don't use that light brown colour. I always use bright colours red and blue and green. It can't be a clue, said Fatty, but he put the stone into his pocket in case. Just then there came the sound of footsteps. And down the path came Lady Candling, Miss Trimble, Mr. Tupping, and Miss Harmer. Mr. Tupping looked important. The others looked upset, and Miss Trimble could not keep her glasses on for more than two seconds at a time. They all looked into the cage, apparently in the vain hope that Dark Queen might possibly be there after all. Miss Harmer gave a squeal. What's the matter? said Lady Candling. Miss Harmer pointed to the floor of the cage. What's that? she said. They all looked in. Ha!、Huh, said Mr. Tapping in a ferocious voice. That's one of them whistles Luke is always making, that is. I'd just like to know how that got there. Miss Harmer took the key of the cat cage and opened the door. Mr. Tapping picked up the whistle. He showed it to Lady Candling. Is this one of the whistles you make, Luke? asked Lady Candling. Luke nodded. He looked very pale. He could not understand how Dark Queen could have gone again, nor how his whistle could have been found in the cage. Luke has been making whistles for all of us, said Fatty. He pulled his own out from his pocket. I expect it's one of our whistles, Lady Candling. It could just as well have been one of ours, couldn't it? But how could it have got into the cage? said Lady Candling, puzzled. Your ladyship, it's quite plain. Said Mr. Tupping. That boy went in to take the cat like he did before, and he dropped this whistle by accident and never saw it. He went out of the cage, locked it, put the key back in its place, and went off with Dark Queen. I don't even know where the key's kept now, said Luke. I usually have it in my pocket, except on the days when I go out, said Miss Harmer. Then I give the key to Mr. Tupping. What do you do with it, Mr. Tupping? I keep it in my pocket too, said Mr. Tapping. But I left my coat along here somewhere this afternoon, so Luke could easily have got at the key. Mark my words, Dark Queen is hidden somewhere about, ready for somebody to fetch away. I knew you'd be sorry, Lady Candling, if you took that boy back again. Stands to reason something of this sort will happen if you do that. I said many a time to Mr. Goon, I am not interested in what you say to Mr. Goon. Said Lady Candling, "I think we will go over Mister Goon's head this time and get in touch with Inspector Jenks immediately." The children were simply delighted to hear this, but alas, the good inspector was away, so Mister Goon had to be notified and arrived full of importance to look for clues and to hear what everyone had to say. He looked suspiciously at the five children, then he looked at the cages as if he expected to find a whole lot of clues there again. But there was nothing to see except the whistle which Lady Candling had given him. You found any clues this time? Said Clearorf to Fatty. We've only found a smell and a stone with paint on it. Said Betts. The others frowned at her so suddenly and severely that she nearly ran away. Oh dear, she shouldn't have told Mister Goon that. Of course, whatever could she have been thinking of? A smell, said Mister Goon disbelievingly. And a stone with paint on. Huh! So you think you can trick me again, do you? 
with smells and stones this time. Well, let me tell you that I'm not believing in any peppermint drops, shoelaces, hair ribbons, smells, or painted stones this time. You can keep all your clues to yourself. And you just remember what I said to you before. If you go interfering with the law, you'll get into very serious trouble one of these days. With that, Mr. Goon turned his back on the children, who at once went to the wall, climbed over it, and sat down to talk about this new happening. Bets! Of all the idiots! said Pip. Fancy telling Clear off our own clues! Are you quite mad? I must be, said Bets, almost in tears. I can't think why I said it. Never mind, Bets, said Fatty comfortingly. Just because you told him, he won't believe you. So if they are clues, it won't matter. Cheer up. It really is a most extraordinary mystery, said Daisy. The mystery of the disappearing cat. Where does she disappear to? And how does she disappear? How I wish I knew. Chapter 19 Buster Really Has Got Brains. What is the most puzzling thing of all? said Fatty. Is the fact that nearly everything is the same as last time. I mean, Luke was there, and only Luke, both times, and Miss Harmer was away, and the whistle was in the cage. It looks as if all those things had to be like that before the cat could be stolen, said Daisy. It looks as if Miss Harmer must be away, and Luke must be there, and so on. It's no good suspecting anyone but Luke this time, said Larry. The cat was there at three o'clock, because both Mr. Tupping and Lady Candling saw it, and Luke was by the cat house from three until Miss Harmer returned, and then she and Mr. Tupping go into the cage and find Dark Queen missing. And Luke says, as he said last time, that no one went near the cage except himself all that time said Pip. Well, I simply do not see how Dark Queen could have been stolen. Everyone was silent. Again, it seemed an absolutely mystifying problem with no solution at all, except that Luke was a very stupid and untruthful thief, but not one of the children could believe that. The children stayed talking until it was Betsy's bedtime. Then they said goodbye and got up to go home. Meet here again tomorrow, said Fatty in a gloomy voice. Not that we can do much. We'll all think hard in bed tonight and see if we can possibly find some way out of this problem. If only we had a few good clues and a few good suspects like we had in our other mystery, said Pip. But you can't call a smell and a blob of paint on a stone clues, can you? Even old Clearoff jeered at those, said Fatty, getting up. Well... So long. See you all tomorrow. And for goodness sake, let's get an idea of some sort. Luke will be absolutely done for this time if we don't. The children did not go to sleep easily that night. They all lay and thought about the mystery of the disappearing cat. Nobody had got any good idea when they met the next morning, except Bets, and she hardly liked to mention her idea because she thought the others would laugh at it. "'Anyone got anything to say?' asked Fatty. "'Well,' said Bets, "'I did get a sort of an idea about one of our clues.' "'What?' said Fatty. "'You know that smell we smelt? Turpentine,' said Bets. "'It was in the cage this time and last time, too. "'It must mean something. "'It must belong to the mystery somehow, mustn't it? "'So it must be a real clue, and we ought to follow it up.' "'How?' said Pip, rather scornfully. Well, we could go and hunt about next door to find where the bottle of Terps is kept, or something like that, said Betts. I don't say it will help, but after all, if it's a clue, we might find out something. Betts is right, said Fatty. She really is. We did smell Terps both times, and of course we ought to go and look to see if we can find where it's kept. Who knows? We might find other clues, then. Let's go now, then, said Pip. No time like the present. Come on, look out for Mr. Tupping, though. He won't like us snooping about. They all went over the wall again, leaving poor Buster in the shed. They sent Pip into the garden to see whereabouts Mr. Tupping was. 
Pip came back and reported that he was tying up something near the house. So we're safe for a bit, he said. Come on, let's sniff in the cage again and see if the smell is still there. Then we'll go hunting for the stuff. They all sniffed in the cage. The faint smell of turps still hung there. Miss Harmer came up as the children were sniffing. She did not seem very pleased to see them. I don't want anyone near the cat house now, she said. This disappearing of Dark Queen twice running is getting on my nerves. I'd rather you kept away, children. Miss Harmer, do you use turps to clean out the cages at all? asked Fatty. Miss Harmer looked surprised. Of course not, she said. I use an ordinary disinfectant. Cats hate the smell of turpentine. Well, how did the smell of turps get into the cage then? said Larry. You sniff, Miss Harmer, and see if you can smell it. But Miss Harmer had not got a very good nose for smelling, and she did not think she could smell anything like turps in the cage. Didn't you yesterday when you went in and found Dark Queen was gone? said Larry. Well, perhaps I did, said Miss Harmer, trying to remember. But I couldn't swear to it. I was so upset at Dark Queen disappearing again. The children peered into the cage, still sniffing. Miss Harmer sent them off. Do go, she said. I feel really nervous now when anyone comes near the cats. Let's go to the shed and see if we can find any turps there, said Fatty. So they left the cat house and went off to the two sheds that leaned back to back, not far from the greenhouses. One shed was full of tools, the other was full of pots, boxes, and odds and ends. You girls take one shed and search it, and we boys will take the other, said Fatty. So they all began to hunt hard in the two sheds, moving pots and tools and boxes, trying to find a bottle of turpentine. What help it would be to them if they did, they didn't really know. But there was no turps to be found anywhere. Larry saw Luke passing by, looking very gloomy indeed. He whistled to him. Hey, Luke! You look as if you had lost ten pounds and found one. Cheer up! You wouldn't feel very cheerful if you felt as frit as I do, said poor Luke. Don't be frit, said Larry, grinning. I do think that's a lovely word of yours, Luke. But nothing would make Luke smile that morning. He felt as if at any moment Mr. Goon would come along and take him off to the police station. What are you doing in them sheds? he said. You'll catch it if Mr. Tuppin comes along and sees you messing about there. We're looking for the turpentine, said Fatty, poking his round face out of the shed. Luke looked astonished. Turps, he said. What do you want turps for? It's kept in the other shed, on the shelf. I'll show you. But what do you want it for? Luke led the boys into the other shed, where Daisy and Bets were. He pointed to a shelf on which various bottles and tins stood. It's there somewhere, he said. The children looked. They picked up one bottle after another and sniffed it, but there was no turpentine at all. We've already looked anyway, said Daisy. Luke was puzzled. It was there, he said. I saw it myself yesterday. Where's it gone? Fatty began to feel excited. Though he didn't quite know why. Mystery of disappearing turps bottle, he murmured. The others giggled. We've got to find that bottle, said Fatty. Why? asked Daisy. Don't know, said Fatty. But we've got to. It's gone. Maybe it's been hidden away. We've got to find it. Well, we can't go sniffing all over the garden to find a bottle of turps, said Larry reasonably. We're not dogs. But Buster is, said Fatty. I bet old Buster could find it for us. Oh, yes, said Bets. Buster has a lot of brains. I know he'd find it. How? said Larry. You can't say to Buster, go and find where a bottle of turps is hidden. He may be a brainy dog, but he's not brainy enough to understand that. I'll manage it all right, said Fatty importantly. Have you got any turps in your garden shed, Pip? Sure to have, said Pip. Well, go and get it, said Fatty, and I'll get Buster. Go back to the wall, everyone, in case Mr. Tupping comes along and wants to know what we're up to. 
Luke went off to his work, still looking extremely gloomy. The others went to the wall. Pip and Fatty climbed over it and dropped down to the other side. Pip went to the garden shed at the top of the garden and found a small jar of turps. Fatty opened the bicycle shed and let out Buster, who tore round and round him, barking as if he had not seen Fatty for at least five years. "Come on, Buster," said Fatty, picking him up. "You've got to do a little work. You've got to show us your doggy brains." In a short time. Fatty, Buster, and Pip were over the wall with the others. "Where's Mister Tapping? Still up by the house?" asked Fatty. "Yes," said Larry. "I peeped to see. The coast is all clear at the moment." "What is Buster going to do?" asked Bets in excitement. "Is he going to be a find outer too?" "I hope so," said Fatty. He shook some turps onto his rather grubby hanky and held it to Buster's nose. "Smell that, old fellow." Smell it good and hard. That's turps. Now you just run all over the place and see if you can find the same smell again. Good old bloodhound, aren't you? He's a turp hound, not a bloodhound," said Bets in delight. "Oh, Buster, aren't you a clever dog? Go and find it. Go and find it." Buster did not like the smell of the turps at all. He looked away from the hanky with a face showing intense disgust. Then he sneezed violently three times. "Go on, Buster Dog, find it, find it," said Fatty, flapping the hanky at him. Buster looked up at Fatty. He knew quite well what "find it" meant. He was always finding things for Fatty. He trotted off, his pink tongue hanging out, his tail in the air. "I shouldn't think he could smell anything but turps wherever he goes," said Daisy, watching him. You simply stuffed that hanky up his nose, Fatty. Buster rushed about in the bushes. He ran round the sheds. He trotted round the cat house. He scurried down the paths. He's looking for rabbits, not turps," said Larry in disgust. "Look, he's found a rabbit hole, and now we shan't be able to make him see sense for ages." Buster had found a hole. It was in a bank. He stuck his nose into it. Gave a whine and began to dig hard in his usual way, sending the earth flying out behind him. "Come out, idiot!" said Fatty. "I didn't say rabbits. I said turps." Fatty pulled Buster out by his hind legs. Something rolled out behind the little dog. All the children stared at it. It was a cork. Fatty picked it up and smelt it. "It smells of turps," he said in excitement. And the others crowded round to smell it. It did. There was no doubt about it at all. In a moment, Fatty was down on his hands and knees, feeling in the hole. He pulled out a bottle. On it was an old label, half torn, but the letters "Turp" could still be faintly seen. There was still a little turpentine in the bottle too. Here's what we were looking for," said Fatty triumphantly. He showed the bottle to the others. Bets went to the hole and peered in out of curiosity. She saw something else there. There's something else, Fatty! She cried in excitement and put in her hand. She pulled out a tin. The others crowded round again to look, feeling very thrilled. What is it? Said Larry eagerly. A tin of paint. Here's a knife. Let me prise off the lid. He did so, and the children saw that the tin was nearly full of a light brown paint. How strange," said Fatty. "It's the colour of that blob of paint on the stone we found. Look." He compared the stone with the paint in the tin. It exactly matched. Larry went down on hands and knees and scraped in the hole again, but there was nothing more to be found. "Now," said Fatty in glee, looking at the turps in the tin of paint. "Now, who put the paint and the turps down that hole?" And why? Chapter Twenty: A Hunt for a Smell. The children were terribly excited. They had two really big clues, though quite how to fit them to the stolen cat they didn't know. What is turps used for? Asked Bets. Oh, to clean paint brushes, to get paint marks off things, said Larry. It's quite clear that this paint and the turps are connected in some way. Funny, there's no brush. 
I mean, you have to use a brush to paint with, don't you? I bet it's down the hole somewhere too," said Daisy. But before she could look, Buster had stuffed his blunt nose into the hole, and a shower of earth covered everyone. The little dog at last came out backwards, and in his mouth he held a small paintbrush. "Isn't he awfully clever?" said Betts in the greatest admiration. "We'd better look and see if there's anything else down that hole," said Fatty. But there wasn't. Fatty lay down at full length and put his arm right in up to the shoulder, but there was absolutely nothing more to be found. "Listen, there's Mister Tapping yelling to Luke," said Fatty. "We'd better get over the wall quick. Here, Larry, just help me to clear up round this hole. We don't want whoever hid these things to see that we found them. It would warn him or her that we were after them." The boys cleared up the mess quickly, whilst the two girls ran for the wall, and Daisy helped Bets over. Then the others came with Buster. They got over just in time, for Mister Tupping came along that way half a minute later, grumbling away to himself. The children retired to their old summer house with their clues and looked at them closely. One small bottle of Terps, one small tin of light brown paint, and one small, very old paintbrush," said Fatty. "And if we only knew how they had been used, why they had been used, and who had used them." We should have solved the unsolvable mystery of the disappearing cat. I must say, I think it was clever of old Betts to think of hunting for the Terps," said Larry. "It certainly was," said Fatty generously. "Can't you think of any other good idea, Betts?" Betts tried very hard. She thought of the cat house and the smell she had smelt there. She thought of the cats there, who all hated the smell of turpentine. She wondered whereabouts exactly in the cage the turps had been put, or spilt, or used. Fatty," said the little girl earnestly, "do you think it would be any good going into the cage and sniffing about to see exactly what place had got the turps on it? I mean, if it was the benches, or the floor, or the ceiling, or the wire netting, I can't see how it would help us, even if we did find the place that smelt of turps, but it just might." Seems rather a silly idea to me," said Pip. "Well, I can't say I can see what good that would do," said Larry. "And anyway, how could we get into the cage? Miss Harmer has the key." "Well, you know, I think there is something in Betts's idea," said Fatty. "Like Larry, I can't see how it would help us if we found out the exact place where the turps had been used. But I have a sort of hunch we'd better go and try, Betts." You're a good one at ideas just now. Betts was thrilled. She did love a word of praise because she got plenty of teasing, and praise from Fatty made up for a lot. Well, how could we get the key? Said Daisy. Miss Harmer keeps it in her pocket. Fatty thought hard for a while. It's a very hot day, he said. I should think Miss Harmer will have taken her jacket off and hung it up somewhere. She won't be doing the cats just now. I expect she'll be at work in the greenhouses. It's part of her job to help there too, you know. I bet she won't be wearing more than she can help in those hot greenhouses. So perhaps we could borrow the key without her knowing for a while. I guess she'll have her coat under her eye with all these disappearing acts going on," said Larry. "Let's go and see," said Pip, getting up. He moved the loose board at the back of the summer house and tucked the three clues there. He put the loose board over them. There, no one will find those clues but us. Come on, let's go and see what Miss Harmer is doing. They all went over the wall again, having first shut Buster into the shed. They couldn't have him rushing round the cat house if they were going inside. Fatty went to scout about and find out where Miss Harmer was. She was, as he had guessed, in one of the greenhouses tying up peach tree branches. She had on her usual trousers and a cool cotton jumper. Fatty looked about for her jacket. It was hung on a nail inside the greenhouse where she was working. Blow! No one could possibly look for a key in the pockets without being seen by Miss Harmer. Fatty went back to the others and told them. We must get Miss Harmer out of the greenhouse for a minute somehow," said Pip. They all thought hard, and some very complicated plans were talked of. 
It was Daisy who thought of a very simple one that could be done without anyone being seen at all. I know, she said. I'll slip along to the end of the greenhouse furthest from the jacket. There are doors each end, aren't there? I'll hide in a thick bush in one of the beds, and then I'll call loudly, Miss Harmer, Miss Harmer! And I bet Miss Harmer will walk out of the door of the greenhouse to see who's calling her, and that will just give one of you time to slip in at the other door and get the key. We'd get into an awful row if anyone saw us taking the key, said Larry. But after all, we are the find outers, and we've got to take a few risks in our work, haven't we? Who's going to get the key? I will, said Pip. Let me do it. I'm very nippy. Yes, you are, said Fatty. All right, you do it, Pip. Now, here's our plan then. Daisy is to go and hide in a bush at the far end of the big greenhouse where Miss Harmer is working. Pip had better hide in a bush near the other end. Daisy will call Miss Harmer, and as soon as she pops out of one door, you pop in at the other, Pip, and get the key. See? It sounds easy, said Pip, but I bet it won't be as easy as it sounds. Are you and Larry and Bets going to wait for me by the cat house? Yes, said Fatty. Come on, let's get going, or Miss Harmer will put on her jacket again. Daisy and Pip left the others and crept through the bushes to the greenhouses. Miss Harmer was still at work near the other end. Daisy settled herself in a thick bush near the further end. She waited until she saw that Pip was safely in another bush near the door inside which Miss Harmer's jacket was hanging. Then the whole plan worked as if it had been oiled. Miss Harmer! Miss Harmer! called Daisy. Miss Harmer heard. She turned her head and listened. Daisy called again. Miss Harmer! Miss Harmer opened the greenhouse door and stepped out. Who's calling me? she cried. And at that very moment, Miss Trimble appeared, trotting down the path, her glasses set crooked on her nose. Oh, Miss Trimble, did you call me? What did you want me for? asked Miss Harmer. Daisy giggled to herself. Now there would be a nice little conversation between Miss Trimble and Miss Harmer. No, I didn't call you, said Miss Trimble, her glasses falling off. But I certainly heard someone shouting for you. Would it be Lady Candling? Why does she want me? said Miss Harmer, going up the path. Where is she? She's over by the lawn, said Miss Trimble. I'll show you. The two went up the path together and were soon out of sight of the greenhouse. Pip at once saw his chance, slipped in at the other door, went to Miss Harmer's jacket, and ran his hand quickly through the big pockets. He found the key at once. Then he and Daisy made their way joyfully through the bushes to the cat house, where the others were waiting most impatiently for them. Here's the key, said Pip proudly. Now come on, let's hurry up and sniff round the cage. I'll go in with Bets, said Fatty. Not you others, or the cats will have a fit. I've got a very good nose for smelling, and as it was Bets's idea, I think she ought to come in too. So the two of them went in together, shutting the door carefully behind them. Then they began to sniff round the cage. It smelt a disinfectant, but there was a distinct smell of turps somewhere. The children sniffed along the benches. The cats lay peacefully and watched them. One cat put out a playful paw and patted Fatty. The smell seems to be on this bench, I think, said Fatty, after he had sniffed at the floor, the ceiling, the wire netting, and the benches. Here, Bets, sniff just there. Don't you think there's a smell of turps there? A big cat was lying on the bench. Bets pushed her gently away so that she could smell. No, said the little girl. I can't smell turps on this bench, Fatty. Fatty sniffed again and looked astonished. The smell isn't there now, he said, but it was a minute ago. Bets lifted back the cat she had moved. There, Puss, she said. Take your place again. Golly, the smell's come back, said Fatty, wrinkling up his nose. Smell, Bets. Why? said Bets in surprise. It can't be on the bench. It must be on the cat. I can smell it now I've put the cat back, but I couldn't before. Then, to the amazement and delight of the big Siamese cat, the two children solemnly and carefully sniffed her all over from head to tail. 
The cat purred happily. She loved being stroked. She loved being petted. But being sniffed at was something quite new, and she liked that too. Does the cat smell of turps? Inquired Pip eagerly. Fatty nodded. His face was scarlet with excitement. Bets, he said. Where do you smell the turps on the cat? Just here, said Bets. And she bent her small nose down to the middle of the cat's dark tail. So do I," said Fatty. He looked very carefully indeed at the long tail which the cat was now trying to swing from side to side. Fatty, Bets, there's someone coming," cried Larry in a low voice. "Come out quick!" But alas for Fatty and Bets! Mister Topping appeared on the scene before they could get out of the cage, and then there was a storm. Mister Topping stared as if he could not believe his eyes. Fatty and Bets got out of the cage and shut the door, turning the key in the lock. Bets was trembling. Fatty did not feel at all comfortable himself. The other children had disappeared into the friendly shelter of the bushes. What you doing in there? Demanded Mister Topping. How did you get the key? I believe it's you children that have been tinkering about with them cats, making them disappear. Oh, yes. That's what it is. You're the thieves, you are. I'm going straight off to Mister Goon to tell him about you. Then you'll be in a pretty pickle, I can tell you, and serve you right too. Chapter Twenty One, Solving the Mystery. Mister Topping went off, and his face was not pleasant to see. Bets was terrified. She clutched Fatty, and her face turned very pale. Fatty himself looked a bit shaken. In silence, the five got over the wall and made their way to the summer house. "Golly, that was a bit of bad luck," said Larry. Bets began to cry. "Shall we be put into prison now?" she sobbed. "Oh, I do feel frightened." "Frit, you mean?" said Larry, trying to make her smile, but Bets was beyond smiling. Don't be frit, Bets. It's all right. We'll have to tell Inspector Jenks about it. How we took the key and how you and Fatty sniffed all round the cat house. Then he won't believe old Clear off if he puts in a report to say he and Mister Tupping suspect us of taking Dark Queen. Fatty was very silent. The others looked at him. Are you frit too, Fatty? Said Daisy. It was not like Fatty to be shaken for long. Fatty shook his head and looked very thoughtful. Let's think about the smell of turps on that cat's tail, he said. That's more important than being scared of having been found in the cage. It's an odd clue that the smell of turps on a cat's tail. Why should it be there? And why was it there before when Dark Queen disappeared? You said turps was used to get paintbrushes clean or to get smears of paint off anything. Said Bets, drying her eyes. Do you suppose the cat had got against some wet paint or something, and the paint was cleaned off with turps? Fatty stared at her. Then he leapt to his feet with a yell and smacked the summer house table hard with his hand. His face went very red. What's up? Said Larry in alarm. Have you sat on a wasp or something? Listen, said Fatty, sitting down again, looking terribly excited. Young Bets has got hold of the right idea. Turps was used to get paint off that cat's tail, and how did the paint get there? And what colour was it? Well, we know the colour because we've got the tin of paint that was used, and we've got a stone with a blob of that same paint on it. It was creamy brown. The others stared at him. Fatty got the tin out from behind the loose board and opened it. He dipped the brush into the tin and then dabbed it on the dark brown summer house table. Look at that," he said. "See that creamy patch? Well, that's what must have been on the cat's tail in the middle of it—creamy brown paint. And now I ask you, what other cat has a patch of creamy brown hairs on her tail? Dark Queen," said everyone at once. Eyes gleamed. And faces grew red with excitement as the five children worked out all that the turps and the paint meant. Yes," said Fatty, 
and that cat whose tail smelt of turps must have had a ring of hairs in her dark tail painted a light colour so that she might be mistaken for Dark Queen, and then the paint on her tail was rubbed off with strong turps. That's why the cage smelt of turps both times. It was done both times. Golly, said Larry, this is frightfully exciting. Somebody made a very clever plan. Let me see. I suppose Dark Queen was stolen away in the morning, and the other cat's tail painted to make her seem as if she was Dark Queen. Everyone knew Dark Queen had a ring of paler hairs in her tail where she had been bitten. Yes, and then people came and had a look at the cats, like your mother did, Pip, with Lady Candling, and they thought the painted cat was Dark Queen. And then later on, Mr. Tupping managed to get into the cage and wipe off the paint before anyone noticed it, and said Dark Queen was gone. Mr. Tupping, said Bets, her eyes getting large and round. Mr. Tupping, did you say? But if Mr. Tupping took off the paint, then Mr. Tupping must have put it on, and he must have been the one who stole Dark Queen and. Yes, it was Mr. Tupping. It simply must have been, said Fatty, almost beside himself with excitement. Would you believe it? And he put the blame on Luke all the time. And made old Luke work beside the cages the whole time the painted cat was there till the time when he wiped off the paint and said Dark Queen was gone, said Pip, so that it seemed as if no one but Luke could possibly have stolen her. What a clever plan! Then, when he heard Betts tell Clear off we had got clues of a smell and a smear of paint, he got the wind up and hid them both, said Fatty, afraid of fingerprints on them or something perhaps, and old Buster found them. Let's get it all quite clear," said Daisy. "Mr. Tupping wants to steal Dark Queen and put the blame on Luke. He waits till Miss Harmer is out for the day, because I suppose he guesses she knows each cat so well that she wouldn't be deceived by painted hairs in a tail. She'd know it wasn't Dark Queen. Yes. So he waits till she's out, and then he steals Dark Queen, hands her over to someone, goes back to the cage. Paints the other cat's tail to make it seem like Dark Queen's. Sees that somebody has a look at the cats and says that Dark Queen is there, like Lady Candling did at four o'clock the first time with your mother, Pip, and Lady Candling again with Mister Tupping the second time at three o'clock. Fatty paused and Larry went on. Yes, and the first time he's very, very clever. He brings back the village policeman himself to see the cats. Manages to rub off the paint with a turpy rag, and then announces to Clear off that Dark Queen is stolen. I must say, Mister Tupping is very cunning," said Larry. "What a nerve he must have, taking the Bobby himself into the cage after he'd stolen the cat that morning. He managed to trick Miss Harmer herself nicely too the second time," said Pip. "You remember he slipped into the cage when she came back that second time, and he must have again rubbed off the paint." And then said, "Dark Queen was gone." That's how it was. He managed to deceive everyone. They all thought, including Luke, that Dark Queen was there all the time. Luke was beside the cage, but she wasn't. She had gone in the morning. So no wonder it was difficult to clear Luke of blame. I suppose Dark Queen must have escaped from whoever had her and wandered back that first time," said Daisy. "I wonder where she is now." Mister Tapping will have to explain a good deal, I think," said Fatty. "Golly, I'm glad he's the thief. I couldn't bear to think it might be old Luke. Wasn't he awful the way he put Luke's whistles into the cage to make everyone think it was Luke?" "Will Mister Tapping go to prison?" asked Bets. "Of course," said Fatty. "Oh, then Luke won't have to work under him any more," said Bets, pleased. It's funny to think Mister Tapping has gone off to Old Clearoff to report Bets and me for being in the cat house this morning," said Fatty. "I wonder what we ought to do." "Let's telephone Inspector Jenks again," said Pip. "Now that we have solved the mystery, we ought to let him know. And anyway, I don't want Old Clearoff coming and arresting Bets or anything like that." Bets gave a little scream. Fatty put his arm round her, laughing. "It's all right, Bets. No one can harm you." You haven't done anything wrong. I think it's a good idea of Pips to telephone to the inspector. What about the key of the cat house? Said Larry. Oughtn't we to put that back in Miss Harmer's pocket? Yes, 
We'll go and do that now, said Fatty. At least I don't see why we shouldn't just hand it to her and say we borrowed it. She'll be surprised and cross, but after all, it's got to come out that we took it, so we might as well own up to it now. The five children and Buster went over the wall. They hunted about for Miss Harmer, but could not see her. Perhaps she's in one of the sheds, said Fatty. They went towards a shed near the greenhouses, one they had not been into before. Fatty put his head inside. Hello, he said. This is where Mr. Tapping keeps his things. Look, there are his rubber boots and his mac. What a smell of turfs again, said Betts, sniffing. You're right, said Fatty, and he sniffed too. The boy suddenly pulled a dirty handkerchief out of the old mac hanging up. It was marked with Mr. Tupping's name and smelt strongly of turps. He soaked this hanky with turps and used it to rub off the paint he had put on that cat's tail, said Fatty. Another clue! Let me see. It had been raining, hadn't it, the night before, and that morning too, so Mr. Tupping would have been wearing a mac. And rubber boots too. I say, look there! The children looked, and there, splashed on the toes of the rubber boots, were drops of the creamy brown paint. Mr. Tupping must have worn the boots when he painted the cat's tail, and it was he, of course, who must have dropped a blob of the paint onto the stone that Fatty had in his pocket, probably off the paintbrush. We'll take these boots and the hanky too, said Fatty importantly. Come on, Buster. We've got some mighty good clues and bits of evidence, I must say. What a shock dear Mr. Tupping is going to get when he hears all we have to say. They went out of the shed and came face to face with Luke, who still looked very gloomy. You're going to get into trouble, he said to Fatty. Mr. Tupping's gone down to get Mr. Goon because he says he found you in the cat house, and he says it must have been you children who took that cat. I suppose he's going to make out that you did it when I was there, and I didn't let on so as to shield you. You're going to get into trouble. Chapter 22 The End of It All Fatty went off to telephone Inspector Jenks. He was lucky enough to get him straight away. Please, Inspector Jenks, said Fatty. We've solved the mystery of the disappearing cat. Could you possibly come over and let us tell you? Well, said the inspector. I've just had a most mysterious message from Goon. Something about finding you children in the cat house and saying he thought you had something to do with the disappearance of the cat. And I was thinking of coming over anyway. Oh, good, said Fatty joyfully. Are you coming to Lady Candling's? Yes, that would be best, said the inspector. Meet me there in an hour's time, will you? Fatty went back to tell the others, to find them all in a state of great indignation. Mr. Goon had been to Betsy's mother and complained to her that the little girl had been caught trespassing in the cat house. He had now gone to tell Fatty's mother that Fatty had been caught there too. Mummy is frightfully cross with me, said Bets with tear-stained eyes. You weren't here, Fatty, so I didn't like to say anything in case I gave away something you didn't want me to give away. So I said nothing at all, and Mummy scolded me dreadfully. Never mind, Bets. Said Fatty. The inspector will soon be here, and once he hears our story, he will soon put things right. We've got to meet him at Lady Candling's in an hour's time. We must take all our clues with us. So, carrying one bottle of turps, one tin of paint, one old paintbrush, one stone smeared with paint, one hanky smelling of turps, and one pair of rubber boots spotted with paint. The children set off down Pip's drive and up Lady Candling's drive in an hour's time. The only clue we couldn't bring was the smell on the cat's tail, said Bats, and that was really the most important clue of all. And it was you who smelt it, said Fatty. I must say, I think you've been a very good find out at this time, little Bats. Look, there's Mr. Goon going into the house, said Daisy, and that's Mr. Tubbing with him. And here comes Luke. Hello, Luke. Where are you going? Been told to wash myself and go up to the house, said Luke, who looked both gloomy and scared. Are you frit? asked Fatty. Yes, I'm frit, said Luke. Well, don't be, said Fatty. Everything is going to be all right. You'll see. Cheer up. 
but Luke could not cheer up. He walked off to wash and clean himself, looking very downcast. Just as the inspector's black car drove smartly up the drive and came to a stop, the big inspector got out and smiled at the children. He beckoned to them. "Who's the guilty person?" he said. "Mr. Tupping," said Fatty with a grin. "I bet you guessed it, Inspector, though you didn't have any clues or anything." "Well, I didn't think it was Luke, and I did think Mr. Tupping was the type." Said the inspector. Also, I happened to know what neither you nor Mister Goon knew—that he has been mixed up in a thieving case before. Dogs, it was, as far as I remember. Well, you go on in. I'm just coming. Everyone was gathered together in Lady Candling's big drawing room. Lady Candling was there. Miss Harmer and Miss Trimble too. Her glasses falling off almost every second. To look at her, any one would think she had been the thief, for she was so nervous, and her hands were trembling and shaking. "Sit down, children," said Lady Candling. Fatty had left outside the door some of their clues, feeling that it would not do to let Mister Tupping see his rubber boots, the tin of paint, or the bottle of turps. The boy did not want the surly gardener put on his guard if he could help it. The children sat down. And Fatty took Buster on his knee to stop him from sniffing round Mister Goon's ankles. The inspector came in and shook hands with Lady Candling. He smiled at the children and nodded to Mister Goon. "I think we'd better all sit down," he said. Everyone sat down. Mister Goon looked important and stern. He gave Betts and Fatty a severe glance. "Aha." Those interfering children were going to get into very serious trouble now. Mister Tupping had reported to him that they had actually taken the key and been found inside the cat house. Well, goon," said the inspector, "I got a rather mysterious message from you this morning, sufficiently serious for me to think of coming over." "Yes, sir, it is serious, sir," said Mister Goon, swelling up with importance. I have reason to believe, sir, that these here interfering children know more about the disappearance of that valuable cat than we think. I think, sir, they're in for very serious trouble, and a good warning from you will do 'em a world of good. Well, I think it is quite possible that these children do know more about this mystery than you think, Goon," said Inspector Jenks. "We'll ask them, shall we?" He turned to Fatty. Perhaps you, Frederick Trotville, would like to say a few words. There was nothing that Fatty wanted more. He swelled up almost as importantly as Goon had done. I should like to say, Inspector, that we five find outers know who stole Dark Queen," said Fatty very loudly and clearly. Tapping gave one of his snorts, and so did Goon. Luke looked thoroughly scared. Miss Trimble's glasses fell off. Much to Betsy's delight, go on, Frederick," said the inspector. "I should like to explain, sir, exactly how the theft was committed," said Fatty. The others looked at him admiringly. Fatty always knew the right words to use. "We should like to hear you, if I may say so," said the inspector gravely, with a little twinkle in his eyes. "Well, inspector, Dark Queen was stolen twice, as you know," said Fatty. Both times, Miss Harmer was out, and Mister Tupping was in charge of the cats. Well, sir, Dark Queen was not stolen in the afternoon each time, but in the morning. Everyone but the children appeared to be greatly surprised. Mister Goon's mouth fell open, and he stared at Fatty in astonishment. Now that he began, but Inspector Jenks stopped him. Don't interrupt, Goon," he said. An old Clearoff dared say no more. "I'll tell you how it was all done," said Fatty, enjoying himself immensely. The thief stole Dark Queen out of the cage in the morning, but he cleverly painted a ring of hairs a creamy colour in another cat's tail, so that to anyone not knowing the cats extremely well, that other cat seemed to be Dark Queen. There was a chorus of exclamations. Miss Trimble's glasses fell off immediately. Well," went on Fatty, "you can see that anyone coming to see the cats in the afternoon would think Dark Queen was there, but she wasn't. 
Then, when the right moment came, the thief hopped into the cage, rubbed the paint off the cat's tail with a rag soaked in turps, and then announced that Dark Queen was missing. So, of course, everyone thought the cat must have been stolen in the afternoon, whereas she had been taken in the morning. And that's why everyone thought it was me that took the cat, broke in Luke, because I was the only one near the cage in the afternoons, and no one came near but me. Yes, said Fatty. That was part of the plan, Luke. The blame was to be put onto you. That was why you were set to work near the cat house each time, and that was why a whistle of yours was dropped into the cage each time, too. Who was it? demanded Luke, his face going scarlet with rage. Just let me get my hands on him, that's all. The inspector sent a glance at Luke, and the boy sat back, saying no more. How do you know all this? asked Mr. Goon. His face a mixture of amazement, disbelief, and scorn. It's just a silly make believe. You got to have proof of these things before you can say 'em. We have got proof," said Fatty triumphantly. He put his hand into his pocket. Look, here is the bottle of turps. It was hidden down a rabbit hole with a tin of light brown paint used for the cat's tail and an old paintbrush. Larry, get the other things. They're outside the door. Fatty brandished the bottle of turps and the paintbrush for everyone to see. Miss Trimble's glasses fell off again, and she was too nervous to replace them. She stared at the clues with short-sighted eyes and looked at Fatty as if he was the greatest detective in the world. Larry brought in the rubber boots and the tin of paint. He set them down before Fatty. Tapping's eyes nearly fell out of his head when he saw his own boots there. Now. Said Fatty, picking up the tin of paint. Here's the paint that was used. Buster found the rabbit hole in which it was hidden, didn't you, Buster? Woof, said Buster, pleased. These boots were worn by the thief, the man who painted the cat's tail. Said Fatty, and he pointed to the drops of light brown paint on them. And this is the handkerchief he soaked with turps and used to wipe off the paint as quickly as possible from the cat's tail when he went into the cage. First time with Mister Goon, second time with Miss Harmer. May I see that handkerchief? Said the inspector with great interest. He took it and smelt it. The smell of turps was still very strong on it. Fatty took the stone from his pocket, the one with the smear of light brown paint on it. He handed it to the inspector too. We found that just outside the cage, sir, he said. That was one of our clues. The other clue was the smell of turps in the cat house. Little Bets spotted that. She was a splendid find outer. Bets went red with joy. The inspector beamed at her. He looked again at the handkerchief. This handkerchief has someone's name on it, he said. I imagine it is the name of the thief. Fatty nodded. Luke leaned forward. Who is it? He said. Go on. You tell me who it is. Yes, whoever is it? Said Miss Harmer. The inspector looked gravely round the little company. Tapping had gone pale, and he kept swallowing hard. All his insolence and conceit had gone. He was more frit than Luke had ever been. One by one, the others looked at Mister Tapping and knew who was the thief. Mister Tapping. What have you got to say about all this? Said the inspector in a voice gone hard as iron. What? It's tapping," said Mister Goon in a half-choked voice, and he glared at the gardener with hatred and scorn. "You sucking up to me, taking me into the cage with you, telling me a pack of lies and making me look foolish like this?" Well. Bets told you we had two clues: a smell and a stone with paint on," said Fatty, "and you only laughed." Tupping, where is the cat?" said the inspector, still in the same hard voice. "You understand that there is no possibility of the charge made against you being false. There are other things in your past which fit in very well with this." Tupping crumpled up completely, from a harsh, cruel, bad-tempered man. He turned into a weeping coward, and it was not a pleasant sight. Bullies are always cowards," Fatty whispered to Larry. 
Now you can see what he's really like underneath. You're frit, said Luke to Tarling in the deepest scorn. More frit than ever I was. Serves you right. This was what everyone was thinking. Suddenly, Tupping began to pour out a confession. Yes, he had stolen Dark Queen. He had owed money to someone, and he had thought of taking the cat. He'd tell who had got it, and the police could get it back. He had tried to put the blame on Luke. He had painted the other cat's tail, and he had used turps to get off the paint quickly. He'd done it twice because the first time the cat had escaped and come back. He was sorry now. He'd never do a thing like that again. You certainly won't for some time, at least," said Inspector Jenks grimly. "You will be in a safe place, out of harm's way, and I don't think anyone will be sorry. Goon, take him away." Goon put a heavy hand on Mister Tupping's shoulder and jerked him to his feet. He looked with great scorn at his prisoner. "You come along with me," he said in a fierce tone. The inspector spoke to Goon in an icy voice. "You do not seem to have shone at all in this case, Goon," he said. "You appear to have made enemies of those who are on the right track, and to have actually made friends with the thief himself. I hope in future you will be a little more careful. I trust you agree with me." "Uh, yes, sir. Certainly, sir," said poor Goon, looking very woeful all of a sudden. Did my best, sir. Well, very fortunately, these children did better than your best, goon," said the inspector. "I think we can be very grateful to them for their work in solving the mystery of the disappearing cat. I hope that is your opinion too, goon." "Oh、uh, yes, sir," said goon, purple in the face now. "Very clever children, sir. Pleasure to know them, sir." "Ah, I'm glad you agree with me." Said Inspector Jenks in a more amiable voice. Now, please remove that man. Mister Goon removed Tapping. The children heaved a sigh of relief. Well, he's gone," said Daisy, "and I hope he never comes back. He will certainly not come back here," said Lady Candling, who had listened to everything in the greatest astonishment. As for poor Luke. I hate to think of all he has gone through because of that wicked tupping. That's all right, your ladyship," said Luke, beaming all over his face, forgetting his anger with Mister Tupping because of the kindness in Lady Candling's voice. If you'll keep me on, Lady Candling, I'll work hard for you till you get a new gardener. And I'll never forget these here clever children. It fair beats me how they solved that mystery. It was really Betts who put us on the right track," said Fatty. Good old Betts. Oh, we all did it together," said Betts. Buster too. Well, I am glad everything's turned out all right, and I expect you'll get your cat back, won't you, Lady Candling? We'll see to that," said Inspector Jenks, getting up. Well, I must go, and once more allow me to say that I am very pleased to have had the help of the five find outers and dog. I trust I may have your help again in the future. I hope you agree with me. Oh yes," said all the find outers, going out to the car with the big inspector. "We'll let you know at once if we've got another mystery to solve." Another mystery. Well, I expect they'll have one all right. Goon put a heavy hand on Mister Tupping's shoulder and jerked him to his feet. He looked with great scorn at his prisoner. You come along with me," he said in a fierce tone. The inspector spoke to Goon in an icy voice. "You do not seem to have shone at all in this case, Goon," he said. "You appear to have made enemies of those who are on the right track, and to have actually made friends with the thief himself. I hope in future you will be a little more careful. I trust you agree with me." "Uh, yes, sir. Certainly, sir." Said poor Goon, looking very woeful all of a sudden. Did my best, sir. Well, very fortunately, these children did better than your best, Goon," said the inspector. "I think we can be very grateful to them for their work in solving the mystery of the disappearing cat. I hope that is your opinion too, Goon." 
Oh, uh, yes, sir, said Goon, purple in the face now. Very clever children, sir. Pleasure to know them, sir. Ah, I'm glad you agree with me, said Inspector Jenks in a more amiable voice. Now, please remove that man. Mr. Goon removed Tapping. The children heaved a sigh of relief. Well, he's gone, said Daisy, and I hope he never comes back. He will certainly not come back here, said Lady Candling, who had listened to everything in the greatest astonishment. As for poor Luke, I hate to think of all he has gone through because of that wicked tapping. That's all right, your ladyship, said Luke, beaming all over his face, forgetting his anger with Mr. Tupping because of the kindness in Lady Candling's voice. If you'll keep me on, Lady Candling, I'll work hard for you till you get a new gardener. And I'll never forget these here clever children. It fair beats me how they solved that mystery. It was really Betts who put us on the right track, said Fatty. Good old Betts. Oh, we all did it together, said Betts. Buster, too. Well, I am glad everything's turned out all right. And I expect you'll get your cat back, won't you, Lady Candling? We'll see to that, said Inspector Jenks, getting up. Well, I must go. And once more, allow me to say that I am very pleased to have had the help of the five find outers and dog. I trust I may have your help again in the future. I hope you agree with me. Oh, yes, said all the find outers, going out to the car with the big inspector. We'll let you know at once if we've got another mystery to solve. Another mystery? Well, I expect they'll have one all right. I must tell you about that another time.